Hey guys, welcome. Can you see and hear me? If you're able to see and hear me, you can give a quick thumbs up so that uh, we can go ahead. <coughs> yeah, good evening. Hey guys, yeah. I think the audio visuals are fine. So do you think like the sound is less or something like that? Audio is fine, right? So I think uh, we are good to go. So most likely today will be a kind of a last session uh, with regards to the medicine Saturdays. I'm going to take a couple of weeks break till your exams. So we're not going to do any more sessions after this. Uh, maybe the next Saturday will be free for you. And after that, uh, of course, you will be busy preparing for your exam. I think we have exactly 14 days left for the exams and I hope you guys are preparing well and revising well. Great. So where I get notes? Somebody is asking where to get notes. You will get the notes probably uh, the annotated version of this PDF. I'll try to save it and I'll put in the telegram groups. Not a problem at all. <clears throat> yes, actually, Dr. Roshan, it's a kind of a prolonged illness that is because uh, I had some issues because of uh, certain bad flus that's going on in Chennai right now. And okay, so we'll discuss about that later on. So this is not the right time to discuss about all those. You want to raise the volume a little bit. Okay, not a problem. Okay, I think now it's fine. So the volume is fine, I guess now. Uh, Dr. Tia, already I posted the PDF in the Telegram group. The non-related version is there in my group and Dr. Zainab's group. So you can just uh, download it and you can annotate it along with me. So not a problem at all. It is there. It's there already in the Telegram groups. Telegram group name is like Dr. Dilip's MMS and you can also see in Dr. Zainab Vora's uh, group as well. So in both the groups I have posted. Okay, thank you Dr. Roshan. Hope the audio is fine now. Okay, Dr. Sonali, we'll start soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for all of your love and uh, wishing you all the very best. Let me move into the session. I'm going to discuss 15 questions in neurology and 15 questions in hematology. Both are basically very important for your exams. I don't know how much to say, like how much to emphasize on the importance of these topics, but trust me, these are very, very important. And first, <clears throat> I'll start with some of the basic questions, then we'll move step by step. So that's how we generally like pace my lectures also. So I start with like, we need some basic understanding of some basic topics. So I'm going to first talk about one of the most important topics. So which of the following is usually the first to be affected in a disoriented patient? You're going to answer. So is it location, name, time, none of the above? Which of the following is usually the first to be affected in a patient who is disoriented? So you know, orientation is there something for time, place and person, isn't it? You'd have studied already. I'm asking which is the one that will be first affected. So the location, name, or probably the time. Perfect. I think uh, many of you have got the right answer already. So it's going to be the time. Okay. The first to be affected in a patient who's going to be disoriented is going to be the time. Okay. Accordingly, whenever you talk about uh, the orientation, so what are the scales that are used to assess orientation? So because there is something called neuropsychological testing, but if I'm going to talk in detail about those neuropsychological testing, it's not going to be like uh, optimal in a kind of a revision lecture like this. So that's the reason I can discuss about two important scales. One is going to be the MMSE scale. So the MMSE scale as such is not going to be asked in exams, but the components of the MMSE scale can be asked. So no need to know the exact pointers with regards to MMSE, but you need to know like what are the like things that are used in the MMSE scale and you need to know what are the relevance of those things that are used in the MMSE scale. Second, we need to know about something called as GCS. That's called as Glasgow Coma Scale. So these are the two important scales that routinely they tend to ask in exams. Routinely, 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 almost all of the time. <clears throat> First, let me talk about uh, the MMSE tool. So what are the things that are going to use in the MMSE tool? 
the first one is the orientation you need to talk about something called as the <coughs> orientation so orientation gets a lot of points with regards to mms in fact 10 points out of 30 is just for the orientation alone so you need to check the orientation for time place as well as for the person but in general we check for the time and the place in the mmsc tool so we have to ask what time it is and more than that uh, you have to ask about like uh, what year it is what season it is what day of the week what is this month so you can ask five different questions and you can give five points for that and second is the place second is the place place in the sense where are you now whether in the hospital or in a clinic if you are in a hospital which floor of the hospital you are in and which like uh, uh, city it belongs to which state it belongs to and which country you are in right now so you can ask some five questions with regards to the orientation to the place and then you can give five points for that so orientation is very very important second apart from orientation so going to you five plus five this itself will carry 10 points in the mmsc score that's called mini mental status examination so then in the second step, we gone to check something called as attention. That's a very, very important point. You check something called attention. How are you going to check attention? You're going to name three unrelated objects for the patient. So what are the three unrelated objects? It could be anything in your language. For example, in Tamil, so what I used to say is Kudai Pura Tangam. So all three are basically unrelated words. So what is Kudai? In English, it's umbrella. So what is Pura? It's pigeon. What is Tangam? It's gold. So all three are basically unrelated words. We say three unrelated words and ask them to repeat them. So by this, you can check the patient's attention and at the same time, you can uh, check the uh, patient's repeating capacity also because in speech, the repetition is a very, very important part. So even that can be checked with this. So by asking the patient to repeat these three words. So for example what you're going to do is three words ask them to repeat it and test the number of trials that the patient is having so that's it so three words okay three words and ask the patient to remember so remember it's not only for this thing it's for registration not only for attention this is for registration also registration means you are registering these words in the patient's brain and then uh, you're going to do something called a serial hundred minus seven serial 100 minus 7 this is also a test of attention it's a very important thing even though that's a kind of math that you're going to do even that can be used as a test of attention or alternative to that is going to be you can ask the patient to spell something backward so for example you're going to tell something called as world and ask the patient to spell the word world backwards how they will spell the word it is d-l-r-o-w so this is how they have to spell for this you can give separate scores so world ask them to spell it backward so both are fine so anyone you can perform both are basically tests of attention so first orientation then attention using the three word registration itself you can use it to later recall that and can check the short term memory also then the third step is recall attention registration and you are going to recall which means what you are going to do is whatever words that you have registered in the beginning you have told something ask the patient to register i mean uh, remember something right you are asking uh, the patient to repeat those words again so that's called recall so you have a separate scoring system for that and apart from that you can test so many other things with regards to mmsc scoring system like <clears throat> you can ask them to uh, name something okay you can test the naming which is also very very important for language you can ask the patient to repeat something repetition which is also very very important part of language and you can do something called as three step command three step command in our uh, practice what we do is in the three step command we ask them to take something fold i mean for example they can take a paper fold into three and keep it in the pocket so taking the paper is number one folding into three is number two and keeping it in the pocket is number three so that's called a three-step command that tests their like uh, ability to understand things and do things correctly so based on this you can do a, a something called as praxis it's very difficult to explain everything in a short uh, session but let me try and do as much as possible so this is called as praxis ability to do something that you have learned already in a correct manner that's called as praxis the ability to identify something 
that you already know to identify is called gnosis and ability to do something which you already know, which you already learnt in your life. That's called as praxis. So for that we have separate programs in the brain. Okay. So then we can test reading also, ask them to read something and next is writing also. We can ask them to write something and next we are also going to ask them to draw something. Okay. So that's called drawing. So write anything, draw something. So typically what picture we use in MMSE scoring system is a double hexagon. One pentagon will be there and one hexagon will be there. So this is the usual image we ask the patient to draw as far as your MMSE is concerned. But you can use anything for that matter. See, any complex diagram, not very complex, but relatively complex diagrams like this, which needs a 3D orientation is something that you can use in MMSE. So there are so many things you are uh, checking, isn't it? So why you are asking the patient to draw? Because this is an example of a visual spatial skill. There are so many skills that we need to know. So remember, whenever you talk about cognition, cognition is different. Whenever I ask any student what is dementia, they tell it's memory loss. Dementia is not memory loss. Memory loss has that separate name that's called amnesia. Dementia means cognitive dysfunction. Cognition has multiple domains. And we have to check all of those domains. It's really, really difficult to check all of those domains in a single go. And it's going to be very, very time consuming. That's the reason why you have some screening tools like this. These are the basic examples of screening tools. Like where you can screen all the domains in a nutshell. Then if there is any problem, then you can dig deeper and you can do a proper full on neuro neuropsychological testing. That is the entire idea of MMSC or any other sc screening tool for that matters. So this is the whole MMSC I have broken down to you. So in that first one is the orientation I told you in any patient who is having altered sensorium, the first thing that will be lost is going to be the time sense. That will be the first thing that will be lost. This is the exact same word that's mentioned in Harrison as well. Then how can you test attention? You can ask the patient to register something by giving three unrelated words or you can use other things like serial 100 minus 7 or alternate to that is uh, ask the patient to spell something backwards. Spell the word world backwards. This is also a kind of test of attention only and you can test immediate memory also with regards to that. There is something called forward digit span. This is also called as digit span. I'll talk about that later on. Digit span. So when you talk about digit span, there is something called forward digit span and there's something called backward digit span. For example, if I'm saying something, some random number to you, 87543 So I, I mean, I told some number. So if you are paying proper attention to what I'm saying, you can type and show me how many numbers, I mean, with, I mean, honestly speaking, don't uh, go back, rewind and come back. So honestly speaking, how many numbers that registered in your mind? So that's a test of immediate memory as well. It's not only a test of attention. It's not only a test of registration. It's a test of immediate memory also. So same test can be used to like assess multiple domains, multiple cognitive domains. So yes, some somebody said some people are saying six, some people are saying, okay, some people are commenting, isn't it? Okay, whatever it is. So how much will be the normal forward digit span? If I ask you to repeat forward, okay, how much will be the forward digit span? It's going to be 7 plus or minus 2. So this is the normal forward digit span. What is the backward digit span? Reverse digit span. It is 5 plus or minus 2. This is the normal backward digit span. This is the normal reverse digit span. This is the amount of like information that can that they can normally repeat backwards. If you are doing like everything, 10 forward and 10 backward, you are excellent. Fine. You are paying good attention and your brain also works very well. I'm not going to deny that fact. But this number can be asked. Once upon a time in INACT exam, they asked this question. So forward, how much is normal? Reverse, how much is normal? Forward digit span 7 plus or minus 2 and backward digit span is going to be 5 plus or minus 2. So now, so having known about all these things, okay, and remember one more thing that can assess is if I do serial 100 minus 7, I'm not only testing attention as such, I'm testing the calculation ability also, the mathematical ability of the patient also. You know, 100 minus 7 is 93. That is not a memory. That's basically a mathematical ability. Nobody mucks up or nobody remembers that 100 minus 7 is 93. 93 minus 7 is 86. We know that's a spontaneous ability of humans. That's a mathematical calculative ability that is done by your parietal lobe. You know that memory is done by your temporal lobe. Okay, there are separate domains for that, separate areas of the brain that process this information. Calculation and mathematics is a completely different ability of us. Okay, to solve problems. So I'm not only assessing like attention with that of serial 100 minus 7, I'm also assessing the calculation ability. So what we are essentially trying to do is we are assessing multiple domains 
okay with simple system okay with one question i can assess so many things so that's the entire idea of it okay how can i assess speech what are the integral components of speech so even this is an exam question right so when you talk about speech so there are two types isn't it one the speech can be affected whenever there is dysarthria so what are the problems with regards to speech there are two problems very commonly asked in exams one is going to be dysarthria second is going to be aphasia both are completely different completely different second is aphasia so what is dysarthria it is a problem of articulation otherwise the, there is no problem of understanding the word output will be fine everything is fine here purely the problem is going to be articulation articulation defect that's all the patient is not able to pronounce properly so what are the different articulation defects that you're going to have so there are three types of dysarthria essentially one is called as palatal dysarthria second is called as lingual dysarthria third is called as buccal dysarthria it's very easy to understand whenever i'm going to have some cranial nerve problem i'll have difficulty in articulation so the dysarthria can be due to a cranial nerve palsy or a cranial nerve dysfunction or dysarthria can be due to some muscle weakness or dysarthria can be due to some subcortical problem so what are the examples of subcortical problem that can result in dysarthria two things one is parkinson disease or related problems second is going to be cerebellar problems both can result in subcortical forms of dysarthria rather anything can result in dysarthria but these are the classic examples when you talk about cranial nerve palsy there are i told you three types are there buccal lingual and palatal so what cranial nerve palsy will cause lingual type of dysarthria hypoglossal nerve palsy what will cause palatal type of dysarthria who is responsible for the movement of the palate the ninth and the tenth nerve the bulbar nerves the bulbar muscles who is responsible for the development of buccal type of dysarthria your facial nerve that supplies the buccal area the facial muscles so how you can test these muscles see again it depends on uh, your regional influence see i am basically from tamil nadu so i use my own language to assess my own patients so one word that i used to tell my patients ask them to tell is something called kasada tapara that's a pure tamil word so likewise you can use your own regional language whatever uh, place you are living in so why i'm using that kasada tapara word because when they want to say ka they have to pronounce from the palate ka so they'll not be able to do that if ninth and tenth now are not working well that's palatal dysarthria they'll not pronounce as ka they'll be like ha ha that's the problem so then in the kasada da da when they want to tell da the you need the like uh, your tongue so if hypoglossal nerve is not working properly then they'll not be able to tell the they'll be like the, the the will not come the da will not come so all are basically based on your tongue and then they cannot say pa so kasada tapara lo se kit pa they cannot say the pa if they can't say pa which means the lips and the buccal musculature is defective so it's very likely to be a uh, seventh nerve type of dysarthria facial dysarthria or buccal type of dysarthria so three types of dysarthria so what are three types we have lingual dysarthria palatal dysarthria and buccal type of dysarthria depending on what nerve is affected so we have different types of dysarthria accordingly and what about subcortical type of dysarthria we know that in parkinson disease the patient is going to have a kind of a slow and a monotonous speech we know that expressionless slow monotonous speech that's parkinson type of dysarthria bradykinetic speech or it could be cerebellar type of dysarthria where the patient will be having a kind of a scanning or a staccato kind of a speech we know that so that's a cerebellar type of dysarthria so these are basically examples of articulation defects so they are not aphasias because they are not problems due to language centers they are not problems due to language language centers so what about aphasia aphasia is a problem of language centers okay so here the language centers are defective language centers are defective that's the problem here language centers so what are the language centers that are going to be defective you have something called as wernicke's aphasia i mean i can uh, not say wernicke's and uh, broca's rather i can just say receptive and expressive aphasia this is more relevant receptive and expressive aphasia to speak okay to do any language so what what is language the way of communication with each other you communicate with me i am going to communicate with you so that that is language so to communicate efficiently i have to understand process and like reply back so that's an efficient way of communication so 
if I have a problem in understanding stuff, that is receptive aphasia. If I'm going to have a problem in expressing, that's an expressive aphasia. The best example of a receptive aphasia, okay, a best example of a receptive aphasia is going to be a Wernicke's aphasia. But currently we don't use the terms Wernicke's and Broca's, rather we just use the term receptive and expressive aphasia. So in Wernicke's the problem is the reception. I'm not able to understand things. That's the problem. So what about expressive aphasia? In expressive aphasia, the problem is I'm not able to express things. That's the problem. So here, the best example will be Broca's aphasia. That's a kind of expressive aphasia. So if you want to understand this very simply, I mean, I used to tell this is not uh, to hurt anyone in the sense like I'm not a male Chauvinistic. I can be 100% sure about that, but I can say one thing. So Wernicke's aphasia, you can imagine like a wife and Broca's aphasia, you can imagine like a husband of that wife. So why? Because in Wernicke's aphasia, they keep speaking. They don't understand what they are speaking. They don't know what they are speaking. They don't understand what others are speaking, but they keep speaking. In Broca's aphasia, they know everything. They can understand everything. They know what others are speaking, how much they're getting scolded, but they're not able to reply. They're not able to speak back. So that is Broca's aphasia, as simple as that. So that's Wernicke's, that's Broca's. Receptive, expressive. Receptive, problems of understanding, reception, Wernicke's, problems of expression, that is Broca's. Examples, but it's better to use the term receptive aphasia and Broca's aphasia, I mean expressive aphasia, rather than using the term Wernicke's and Broca's aphasia. Okay, so then we have multiple different types also, that's called uh, transcortical sensory, transcortical motor, then we have conduction types of aphasia. So there are so many other things that are involved. So I'm not going to talk about that in a little bit of, I mean, detail, but rather I can just give you certain clues. So how to diagnose in exams. So let us assume if there is a Wernicke's aphasia, the clue will be very simple. Patient's comprehension will be lost. Okay, patient's comprehension will be lost. Repetition also will be lost but fluency will be very high. They keep speaking, 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 speaking. So that is typical of Wernicke's aphasia. So what about Broca's aphasia then? In Broca's aphasia, the comprehension will be intact because they can understand what others are speaking, but they cannot repeat. The repetition circuit will be lost and the fluency will be very, very low. So if you see this picture, this is very likely to be Broca's aphasia. Then we have something called transcortical sensory aphasia. Transcortical sensory aphasia. What do you mean transcortical sensory? Here, the Wernicke's and Broca's are not a problem, but higher center to Wernicke's is affected. The higher center that gives input to Wernicke's is affected. So here, because it's a higher center to Wernicke's is affected, that controls the Wernicke's itself, the comprehension will be lost, but repetition will be intact. This is a key feature of any transcortical aphasia. Okay, transcortical aphasia. I mean, the higher centers are affected and the lower centers like Wernicke's, Broca's and the arcuate fascicle is intact, the repetition will be intact. That's a very important point. And the fluency will be relatively normal. Okay, it won't be increased or it won't be decreased. Fluency will be normal and that's why it's also called as a fluent aphasia. What about transcortical motor aphasia? Transcortical motor aphasia, here the comprehension will be there because it's a higher center to Broca's that is affected. So the comprehension will be there, but repetition also will be there, but fluency will be reduced, diminished significantly. Fluency will be reduced significantly. So what is the key feature of transcortical aphasias? Whenever they talk about transcortical aphasias, your repetition will be intact. Others may be affected, but repetition will be intact. So if repetition is intact, you have to talk about transcortical aphasias, whether sensory or motor, you can split it based on the comprehension. Then finally, uh, we have two more aphasias. One is called as conduction aphasia. What about conduction aphasia? In conduction aphasia, comprehension will be intact. Fluency will be okay, fluency will be normal, but patients will lose repetition. Repetition will be lost. So if only repetition is lost, that is called as, only repetition is lost, that is called as conduction aphasia, where the problem will be in the arcuate fasciculus. I'm repeating the problem will be in the arcuate fasciculus. If only repetition is lost, isolated loss of repetition exam is always equivalent to conduction aphasia. Then finally, we have global aphasia where everything will be lost. Patient will be mute and patient will not be able to understand anything. Comprehension nigh, rep repetition lost and fluency is also gone. So patient will not be able to do any of these domains. So uh, that is a global aphasia. 
Finally, we have a special type of aphasia called as nominal aphasia. Nominal aphasia. So nominal aphasia in the sense the patient will have everything normal. So comprehension will be normal, repetition will be intact, fluency will be normal, only naming will be lost. Only there's another domain called as naming that will be lost. That's the only thing that will be lost in nominal aphasia. One of the uh, earlier features of Alzheimer's disease. The pain is suffering from Alzheimer's disease. This is one of the early features of Alzheimer's disease. Naming alone will be lost. So these are things that you need to know. If you want to tell this in an algorithmic fashion, it's actually quite simple. So first, whenever you talk about aphasia, see where the patient is having fluent aphasia, non-fluent aphasia. Look at the fluency. Whether fluency is there or fluency is not there. If fluency is there, that means it's a fluent, fluent aphasia, which means patient is able to speak something. That's a fluent aphasia. If fluency is not there, that is called as non-fluent aphasia. Non-fluent aphasia. So fluent aphasia, non-fluent aphasia. If it's a fluent aphasia, next step is to look at the comprehension. Okay, comprehension should be seen. Whether comprehension is there or comprehension is lost. Fluent aphasia, comprehension is intact. So what do you think? It must be either a vernicase or probably a transcortical sensory. I mean a brocas or, uh, I mean brocas will not be fluent, isn't it? So if the comprehension is there, yeah, yeah somebody is asking about the defect in the nominal aphasia. So it's near the angular gaze, somewhere near that area. Okay. Comprehension is there and if the patient is having a fluent aphasia. So what do you think? So it must be either like a nominal aphasia or it must be a conduction aphasia. So look at the repetition. If repetition is lost, repetition is lost, then it's very likely to be a conduction aphasia. If repetition is intact, if repetition is preserved, it's probably a nominal aphasia. Everything is there, but only not naming will be lost. So in this condition, naming alone will be lost. So that is nominal aphasia. In case the patient is not having comprehension, look at repetition. Look at repetition. Whether repetition is lost or repetition is intact. Repetition is lost, then it must be vernicase aphasia. If repetition is intact, it must be a transcortical sensory aphasia. I told you one of the key features of transcortical sensory aphasia is repetition and it will be intact. So that is transcortical sensory aphasia, repetition if it's there. On the right side, if the patient fluency is lost, it must be a non-fluent aphasia. If it's going to be a non-fluent aphasia, then again look at the comprehension, whether it is lost or whether it is intact. So if the comprehension is lost, it must be Broca's or transcortical sensory. So see the repetition. If repetition is lost, it must be a Broca's aphasia. If repetition is intact, it must be a transcortical motor aphasia. Again, I'm repeating that whenever repetition is there, I mean, one of the important features of your transcortical aphasias is going to be intact repetition because there's a problem of higher centers and it doesn't involve the repetition circuit. If comprehension is lost, okay, a patient who is not having fluency and who is not having comprehension, okay, very likely it will be a global aphasia. No comprehensive, no, no comprehension and no fluency also. Here everything will be lost. Repetition will be lost, naming will be lost and everything will be lost. So this is a kind of a simplified algorithm which will help you understand. So what is the type of aphasia that's going on in a patient? Even that is a very, very important topic. And another final point that I want to say is the fact that aphasia is going to occur due to left-sided lesions, which means only dominant hemisphere lesions will produce aphasia. Non-dominant hemisphere lesions usually will not cause aphasia, will cause some other problems. I cannot talk, uh, talk about right now because it's going to become too much. So the left-sided lesions, the dominant hemisphere lesions are the ones that are going to cause aphasia. If right-sided lesions cause aphasia, that generally is called as crossed aphasia. I don't know how much relevant is that. But dominant hemisphere lesions, left-sided lesions are the ones that are generally going to produce aphasia, not the right-sided lesions. Because in most of us, 97% plus times, the left hemisphere is the one that's going to be dominant hemisphere and it's not the right hemisphere that's going to be dominant in most of us. So that completes our uh, aphasia discussion also and naming, you know now what is the importance of naming, you know the importance of repetition and uh, 
you have to know the importance of reading and writing. So what is reading? Reading and writing also is a kind of language only. So patient may not, I mean, we, we need not express in terms of like speaking all the time. We can express in terms of reading and we can receive in, I mean, express in terms of writing and we can receive in terms of reading. So reading is a art of reception. So it's kind of understanding, reception. And writing is like expression, right? So in Broca's aphasia, the reading in most of the fluent aphasias or in most of the receptive aphasias, in most of the receptive aphasias, reading will be lost. In most of the receptive aphasias, reading also will be lost. In most of the expressive aphasias, the writing will be lost. Like for example, in Wernicke's aphasia, reading will be lost. In Broca's aphasia, writing will be lost. Likewise, same thing in any like receptive aphasia like Wernicke's or transcortical sensory or even global aphasia, the reading will be lost. Similarly, in Broca's aphasia, transcortical motor and even in global aphasia, the writing will be lost. But in conduction aphasia and nominal aphasia, the reading and writing will be literally intact. So that will not be affected. The only thing that will be affected in conduction aphasia is going to be the repetition part. The only thing that will be affected in nominal aphasia is going to be the um, naming part. That's the only thing that will be affected. So now we can understand. So how many domains that we are testing in each and everything. And remember that uh, this diagram is important because we are assessing the three dimensional skills. There's something called visual spatial skills. Even that has to be assessed whenever you are doing a MMSE score. So one question from neurocyclical testing is very, very common. Okay. So that's what you need to know. And what about the Glasgow coma scale? So this is something that's so often asked. So usually we are going to use in patients. I mean, initially it was used for patients who are suffering from head injury, but later on we have been using this for almost everything. Every inpatient who are in the ICU, we are using the GCS. It has become an integral part of our like assessment of so many things in our hospital. So Glasgow coma scale. So what are the four important things about Glasgow coma scale? First, you have to check. So these are the four steps. Check. Second, observe. Third, stimulate. This is the order. Third, stimulate. And the fourth one is rate. Okay, this is the thing that can be asked in exams. Okay, so this is the order. So what are you going to do? While doing Glasgow coma scale, the sequence will be check, observe, stimulate, rate. First, you're going to check what's happening. Then observe, for example, for eye opening, what they are speaking and all those stuff and uh, whether the patient is spontaneously moving limbs or not. So that's observation. Then if the observation shows some abnormality, then stimulate them. Like for example, you give some pain to the patient or you can uh, speak something near the eyes and ask them to do something. So stimulate. Then finally, you're going to rate the scale. So that's the idea. So you know, Glasgow Coma Scale is going to be rated as E4, V5, M6 or simply called as EVM scale. So E4, V5, M6. So what do you mean by E? I mean, uh, I don't know whether uh, teaching this really is important or not, because many of you might be knowing this already. But one thing I can say, it's very, very important for exams. So every time they ask this and every time students make a mis mistake also in Glasgow Coma Scale. So E, so we have E4, V5, M6. What is E4? The patient is uh, opening eyes spontaneously, spontaneous opening, that is E4. Then what about E3? So only they are opening to sound, that is E3. So what is E2? E2 means patient is opening only to uh, touch stimulus or maybe to pressure. So you're touching or giving some painful stimulus for that only the patient is opening the eyes. That is two. E1, nothing. Okay. So the patient is not opening their eyes at all. It is going to be uh, zero. I mean, it's going to be E1. So whenever it is non-testable, you're going to write NT. So sometimes it can be non-testable. So what about the patient's eyes are closed? Okay, due to some cataract surgery or maybe some eye surgery has been done recently. Or patient uh, is having a road traffic accident where eyes are very badly damaged. So those are the kind of patients that are going to look, isn't it? So if it's non-testable, just write NT, that's all. If the eyes are not there, if the patient is blind, or if the patient is having only artificial eyes, there are so many clinical situations I can say. So if that is the case, just write it as NT, that is non-testable. So that is E4, E3, E2, E1 and NT. So what about V verbal? So we have uh, V5, V4, V3, V2 and V1. V5 is spontaneous and sane speech. That's very important. Spontaneous and sane, sane speech, which means it's a kind of a oriented speech. Patient knows what he's speaking. There's no disorientation in his speech. V4. If the patient is d confused, disoriented, the speech may be spontaneous, okay, but the speech is not sane. 
it doesn't make any sense he's confused he is like uh, not speaking like with a proper orientation he's talking something else some nonsense that is confused speech that is v4 so he may be speaking spontaneously because why many times students think like spontaneous speech is v5 no he might be speaking spontaneously but the words may not not make sense that is v4 it's a confused speech what about v3 patient is not able to speak sentences but rather they are able to speak only words few words okay that is v3 what about v2 patient is not even able to speak words they are only making some sounds like they may make some grunting sounds like <coughs> ah <coughs> some sounds like this these are grunting sounds like so that's going to be v2 v1 means no response patient is not able to make sound and if it's not testable for example patient is intubated or patient is having a tracheostomy okay in these situations patient will not be not be able to speak at all so something is interfering with communication whatever it may be something is interfering with communication like tracheostomy or probably intubation then write nt it is non testable that's all so that's what you need to write so whatever i'm telling is like the same thing will be asked in exams clear so what about motor motor response is m6 right slurred speech no 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 slurred speech is not going to fit anywhere so that is dysarthria and aphasia i mean maybe it could be dysarthria or aphasia that's different but where the patient is able to orient or not able to orient that is the problem the speech quality is not a problem whether they are speaking words or sounds or sentences if they speak sentences whether it makes sense or not that is the problem whether it is slurred or not is not our problem at all with regards to the glasgow coma scale so what about m6 m6 means he obeys commands so what you are asking him to do he is doing it he is ask you are asking to raise raise his hands he is able to raise his hands let us assume the left side is paralyzed he is not able to lift the left side at all the left arm and left leg is paralyzed still it could be m6 okay so, i mean you cannot say like it's m1 still it could be m6 right for example with the right arm and right leg he can still move okay so that is uh m6 suppose if the patient is quadriparist the patient is quadriparist what you will do patient is completely paralyzed all four limbs power 0 by 5 what you will you uh, what will be the m scale that's a question for you completely paralyzed all four limbs quadriparesis what's the m scale what's the m scale waiting for your answers you look for neck okay neck you are not, not able to move but it's not appropriate but you cannot move the neck meet patel is saying that the score is 1 only one person who is correct is shivani singh actually it is not testable nt non testable that's what you have to write it is non testable it is not one so if the patient is having paralysis i'll repeat if the patient is paralyzed all four limbs not able to move the limbs at all see any limiting factor that not not, not going to allow you to test it is non testable that's it okay best motor response the patient is completely paralyzed not able to move their limbs it is not testable that's all nt so remember with eye movements see previously we used to do all those things but now the guidelines are very clear okay gcs guidelines are very clear it should be non testable that's it you cannot say like uh, look up look down and say like is oriented no obeying command no 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 you should not use the eyes you should only use the limbs that's a very important point okay or maybe gaze movements yeah to some extent but <laughs> the guidelines are very clear man so if it's any limiting factor if it's paralyzed if you're not able to do better write it as non testable okay that's more relevant actually in this context okay so m6 obeying commands then m5 so what about m5 localizing localizing you are giving a painful stimulus and the patient is able to localize so where to give the painful stimulus that's very important right minimum score is 3 so where to give the painful stimulus where to give the painful stimulus see there are three areas where you can give the painful stimulus one is the fingertip i'll repeat one area where you can give the painful stimulus is the fingertip 
Second area is near the trapezius. Okay. Third area is the supraorbital notch. Again, I'm saying only three areas approved by the GCS group. So suprasternal pressure, no, no. This is not approved by the GCS group. GCS group has approved only uh, like pressure in three areas, pain response in three areas. One, suprasternal. Second, okay. Second, your trapezius, back trapezius. Third is going to be the fingertips, okay, near the nail beds. So these are the three areas, okay, where you have to check. Previously, they are, they are they're okay with sternum and all, but right now they're not okay with sternum, okay? So you're not testing the sternum. That sternum is not like a part of like usual assessment of a GCS scale. But to test for localization, you need to use only one area. Generally, we have to give stimulus on the head and neck area. You should not use the fingertips. That's very important. If you want to test for M5, you should not use the fingertip, okay? You should use either the trapezius pinch or you should use the supraorbital notch. Why? Because what is localizing? Localizing means the patient should try to push your hands away or they have to bring their hands closer to the painful stimulus at least. So if you are giving the pain in the fingertips, how can assess localization? They will just withdraw. That becomes different. Okay, that's not correct. So what's going to occur is, so remember localizing means you have to give the painful stimulus in either supraorbital notch or in the trapezius. Only in the head and neck you should test, okay, for M5. So the patient should bring the hands towards the painful stimulus or they will try to push your hands away. That is localizing, okay, localizing. What about M4? What about M4? M4 is withdrawing from pain. Withdrawing from pain. So in exam, they may not use the term withdrawing from pain. Please listen to this. They can. They may not use the term withdrawal from pain. They may use the term normal flexion. That is M4. If they use the term normal flexion, it is M4. Withdrawal from pain means normal flexion. That is normal flexion. That is normal flexion. Okay, withdrawal from pain. Normal flexion. If it's M2, M3, then patient will have abnormal flexion. Okay, patient will have abnormal flexion. So what do you mean by abnormal flexion? Usually in colloquial terms, this abnormal flexion is called as decorticate rigidity, okay, decorticate posturing. They're going to produce an abnormal flexion like this, okay, towards their body. That's abnormal flexion. That's not a normal flexion. Normal flexion is withdrawal from pain. That's different. For withdrawal, you can use painful stimulus in the fingertips, okay. Withdrawal, painful stimulus in the fingertips, they're going to withdraw from it. That's normal flexion. So if you give painful stimulus here and the patient goes for abnormal flexion like this or if you're giving painful stimulus in the head and neck and the hands go like this, that is abnormal flexion, okay? So that is M3. In colloquial terms, we also call it as something called as decorticate posturing. And what about M2? M2 is abnormal extension or I mean not abnormal, it's just extension. Whenever the patient is extending to painful stimulus, it's abnormal by default. It, we cannot call it as abnormal extension. It is extension by default. Okay. It's abnormal by default. So extension, it is M2. In colloquial terms, we tend to call it as decerebrate posturing. But you should not use those terms in GCS. But in practice terms, we use the term called as like uh, decerebrate, but it's not accurate or it's not appropriate. So M1 means no response, no matter what. And if the patient is paralyzed, it's better to use the term non-testable. Okay, that's fine. So remember, abnormal flexion, abnormal extension, normal flexion is only that particular arm, they're going to move away from the painful stimulus. That is normal flexion. Abnormal flexion usually will be occurring with stimulus only. So what is the important thing about this flexion extension? Can anyone say? Another important thing about this posturing is there. Another important thing about this posturing is there. Because this posturing is basically due to activity of the extrapyramidal tracts like roborospinal tract or tectospinal tract or something like that. What is the important applied aspect of that that can be asked in exams? If there is posturing that rules out brain death, okay? So basically when you're talking about brain death, we are not talking about brain death, we are talking about brain stem death. So technically whenever there is a posturing, it indicates that the brain stem tracts are still there, extrapyramidal tracts are still working. So if there is posturing in an individual, that clearly tells that it is not brainstem death. So which means you can exclude brain death if there is posturing.
You cannot diagnose brain death in that individual. That's a very important point. Has been asked innumerable times in your exams. So minimum GCS score. It depends. See, minimum score is three, but it could be two NT also. It could be one NT also. If it's not testable, it's not testable. That's different. But ideally, if you're able to test all the parameters, then the minimum score is three. Maximum score is going to be 15. That's it. Minimum score three, maximum score 15. If you're able to test all the parameters. So originally it was this, I mean, it was like actually uh, brought to find about your head injury only, right? For the head injury. So accordingly, you can say mild, moderate or severe head injury. So any GCS of 14 to 15 is basically mild head injury. Any GCS of 8 to 13 is moderate head injury. 9 to 13 is moderate head injury. 9 to 13 is moderate head injury. And GCS of less than or equal to 8 is called as severe head injury. It's severe. Severe head injury. And usually when they ask about Glasgow coma scale definition of a coma, this is usually indicative of a coma. Even though that coma is a different word altogether, but the GCS definition of coma is less than 8. And gen generally whenever the score is 8 and below that, okay, so you need to be sure that you have to intubate the patient because the airway protection will be lost in this case. So intubation is mandatory in anyone with the GCS of less than or equal to 8. This is what we follow in the emergency protocols also. GCS less than 8, intubate them. That's it. So now with this one question, I think we have understood so many things, right? So the right answer for this question is C, but I've told so many associated things which can be asked in exams. Clear? Now going to the second question. So all of the following statements regarding astrocytes are true except option A, they actively phagocytose synapses. Option B, they exert, I mean, they exert effects on the life of synapses. Option C, they make up more than 90% of all the CNS cells. Option D, they participate in dynamic regulation of the vascular tone. I'm waiting for an answer. ICH scoring is different, uh, Dr. Aditya. That's for uh, this thing, intracranial hemorrhage, and that uses different parameters like age, probably the volume of the bleed, and uh, that uses the supraventral, infratentorial bleed, the GCS also. So many parameters are involved in ICH scoring. So what is the right answer for this question? So I'm getting different answers, C, D, A and so on. Basically the right answer for this question is option C, they make up more than 90% of the CNS cells, that's wrong. Actually, I've framed all these questions only from Harris and nothing more than that. So they make up like around 50 percentage, approximately 50 percentage of all the central nervous system cells, not 90 percentage. Most of, I mean, almost half of them will be neurons and half of them will be supporting cells, astrocytes. Previously, we thought that these astrocytes are going to be only simple interstitial supporting cells. But right now, we know how important they are in maintaining a lot of functional activity in the brain. Like... What are the, what, for what all, what all they are important? So first of all, they actively phagocytose synapses. That's a correct statement. Okay. So which means they play a very, very important role in maintaining the life of synapses. So whether that synapse should be existent or synapse should be non-existent. For that, astrocytes play a very important role. See, best example to understand that is you don't remember everything, whatever you see, whatever you hear, isn't it? Over time, you tend to forget things because one of the main reasons what they think is there are a lot of reasons for that. One of the main reason is non-functioning synapses will be actively phagocytosed by astrocytes so that they will render it non-functional. So the life of the synapses itself is basically regulated by your astrocytes only to a large extent. And fine tuning your synapses is also by astrocytes only. So exert effects on the life of the synapses. That's correct. And they participate in the dynamic regulation of the local vascular tone. That's absolutely correct. They have something called food process, isn't it? Astrocytes. They are like your uh, mononuclear macrophage system. Okay, isn't it? So they are going to be like a phagocytic cells in the brain. So they're going to have an impact on dynamic regulation of the vascular tone. And they produce something called calcium waves that can regulate the vascular tone. The plenty of things that are regulated by astrocytes. Uh, but what I want to say is, you have something called as Aquaporin 4 channels, that's an applied aspect of this. So they express something called aquaporin 4 channels. 
occur four in four channels. These are water channels, isn't it? So that has a lot of functions in the brain. Okay, but tell me what is the disease that's going to occur because of antibodies against aquaporin 4 channels? You're going to answer. So who is expressing aquaporin 4 channels? Astrocytes. Especially the food process of the astrocytes. That is the one that's going to express this aquaporin 4 channels. So what disease is going to occur because of antibodies to aquaporin 4 channels? What is the disease called as? So that disease is called as NMO. I don't get, I'm not getting any answers. That disease is called as NMO. So that is neuromaltase optica, previously called as DVX disease, anti-aquaporin 4 antibodies or anti-aquaporin 4 IgG antibodies. Basically, what are these antibodies doing? They are against your astrocytes or aquaporin 4 water channels of the astrocytes. That's what you need to know. And one interesting news is the fact that uh, there have been a lot of controversies with regards to the brain of Albert Einstein. And they wanted to find out what is the difference between a normal human brain and a genius's brain like Albert Einstein. To be honest, till date, nobody was able to find out any difference between the normal human brain and Albert Einstein's brain. Very few differences, whether in that one of the prominent differences is Albert Einstein's brain had so much of astrocytes, extra astrocytes. We don't know what is the function. Now, after that, only they start understanding how important is astrocytes. Probably if your brain is also going to have more astrocytes, probably you can also maybe a genius like Albert Einstein. You might have so much of a uh, different level of like genius like thinking probably. So that's the only main difference that they found out with regards to Albert Einstein's brain. Nevertheless, let us move on to the next question. Now we are moving to the Caesars. This is a very important question. So which, I mean, it's about the topic I, by the way. So which are the following factors is that is of greatest concern regarding the risk of recurrent Caesars. So this is a very commonly asked question in exams. So focal defect on neurological examination, generalized seizure disorder, head trauma, seizures within the last seven years. What do you think is the factor that's of greatest concern regarding the risk of recurrent seizures? Recurrent seizures. Okay. Let me tell you the answer. The answer is focal neurological defect on neurological examination. Focal different neurological examination is the factor that's going to be of greatest concern regarding the risk of recurrent seizures. So again, straight lines from Harrison. Okay. So what are the factors that determine whether the patient will be seizure free or not? Okay. After discontinuing an antiepileptic drug. Factors that determine whether the patient will be seizure free or not after discontinuing antiepileptic drug discontinuing antiepileptic drug okay there are plenty of factors again straight lines from harrison that's what you're going to get in exam number one if the patient is having complete control complete control so what do you mean by complete control harrison defines that as well complete control means yeah, patient has to be seizure free on antiepileptic drugs for at least one to five years. So why such a broad range? Because different types of seizure poses different kind of threats and different type of concerns. That's why you have a big number like one to five years. But in clinical practice, we keep a cutoff of approximately two or three years generally. But depending on the seizure type, depending on the risk of recurrence, you can keep a cutoff one to five years. Patients should not have any seizure when they are using antiepileptic drugs. Number two, if the patient is having only one seizure type, one seizure type, they should not have multiple seizure types. For example, what is Lennox Gustard syndrome? Patient have multiple seizure types. What is atypical absence seizure? Patient will not only have absence seizure, they will have associated GTCS also. That's multiple seizure types. So if there's only one seizure type, focal or generalized, okay, that's it. Or even in focal or generalized, only one type of seizure. So that is going to tell you it's very likely to be seizure free after discounting antiepileptic drugs. Third, patients are having normal EEG. This is a very important point because many times they have asked this question, a normal EEG does not rule out seizure disorder. EEG is having good specificity, but they are not very sensitive. A normal EEG does not rule out a seizure disorder or epilepsy. It's a very important point, especially surface EEG is very, very poorly sensitive. So normal EEG, if it is there, then the likelihood of being seizure free is going to increase. If it's abnormal EEG, then the risk of 
uh, getting recurrent seizures is very very high. Number four, if the patient is having normal neurological examination, which means no focal neurological deficit, no focal neurological deficit. So this is the most important actually. If the patient has focal neurological deficit, then the risk of recurrent seizures are very very high, irrespective of the reason for the seizures. So that's why he said presence of focal defect on neurological examination is the one that should be of greatest concern regarding the risk of recurrent seizures. Patient having head trauma is not a problem at all. So that's not going to determine whether the patient will be remaining seizure free or whether the patient will not remain seizure free. Having a generalized seizure disorder doesn't tell you what if the patient is having more than one seizure types. They will have risk of recurrence. Seizure within the last seven years is wrong. Okay, patient should have a complete control for the last five years. Not seven years though. So if that is the case, then uh, you can say that the risk of getting recurrent seizures is very, very low. And what about the drugs? Let us talk about the drugs to some level. So you need to know about the drugs, right? So what drugs you're going to use in what situation? For that, you need to know what are the different types of seizures that you have in practice. So we have something called as generalized seizures. We have something called as, uh, what to say, uh, focal seizures. For each and everything, what are going to be the drug choices? For, for that matters, for generalized seizures, what is the choices according to your this thing interpretation first line complete control on drugs yes i mean complete control on drugs head trauma can cause seizures yes very well they can rise icp and they can cause seizures intracranial pressure will be raised and that's a very important reason for folk, i mean uh, provoke the seizures so generalized seizures what is the first line drug First line, first line, generalized seizures. Yes, when you talk about generalized seizures, you have to talk about valproate. Valproate, that is the most important point, valproate. Then what are the other drugs that you can use? Alternative drugs, alternative drugs. You can use lamotrigin. You can use lamotrigin and you can use levetiracetam. You can use something called as levetiracetam. These are alternative drugs that you can use. And there's something called ethosuximide, which blocks the T-type calcium channels. That's thalamic type, T-type, transient type calcium channels, okay, ethosuximide. But we know that ethosuximide is going to be indicated only in absent seizures. It's a drug that's tailor made to treat only absent seizures. You cannot use ethosuximide for anything else apart from absent seizures. What is the important point with regards to lamotrigin? It can worsen one type of generalized seizure. What type of generalized seizure? Is going to worsen it going, it's going to worsen something called as myoclonic seizures even this is an exam question okay myoclonic seizure so two important points i told you side by side lamotrigin worsens myoclonic seizure ethosuximide only for absent seizure you cannot use it for anything else okay and what are the other alternative drugs i mean second line drugs second line drugs topiramate topiramate is a second line drug okay and or you can use zonisamide which is similar to topiramate both are almost similar only, topiramate and zonisamide. Okay, so what can worsen generalized seizure? What drugs can worsen generalized seizure? Worsen generalized seizure. Your calcium channel blockers. What are the calcium channel blockers? Gabapentin. Many students ask, okay? Many students ask like whether gabapentin is a calcium channel blocker or not. Yes, trust me, it's a calcium channel blocker. It doesn't work by GABA mechanism. It's basically a calcium channel blocker. But the name is gabapentin. What can I do? Pregabalin. Another calcium channel blocker. Both these are basically calcium channel blockers. They are going to worsen generalized seizures. Any generalized seizures for that matter. And two drugs. Carmazepin and oxcarbazepin. Okay. Both are going to worsen generalized seizures. You should not give these drugs. And what about your focal seizures? Focal seizures. Including secondary generalization. First line drug is going to be carmazepin but very commonly we use oxcarbazepin i think because this question was asked in the recent ina ct exam you will be like knowing that it's going to cause more hyponatremia and more sadh compared to the, drug, the original carmazepin itself but apart from that it's a relatively safe drug but you would have studied isn't it many people have taught you that preferred drug is actually oxcarbazepin only but it's going to cause relatively more risk of hyponatremia compared to the Original drug carbamazepin itself. And next is lamotrigin. Lamotrigin. This can be tried in focal seizures as well. And what about the second line drugs? Second line drugs are going to be gabapentin, pregabalin, 
ప్రీ కావాలి ఇంత కాల్షియం ఛానల్ బ్లాకర్స్ అండ్ యూ క్యాన్ యూస్ టోపిరమేట్ అండ్ జోనిసమైట్ టోపిరమేట్ అండ్ జోనిసమైట్ ఓకే దీస్ ఆర్ ద డ్రగ్స్ దట్ క్యాన్ బీ యూస్డ్ అండ్ అనదర్ క్వశ్చన్ దట్ విల్ బీ ఆస్డ్ ఇస్ ఇఫ్ ద పేషెంట్ ఇస్ ఎ ఫీమేల్ విత్ రీప్రోటీ ఏజ్ ఫీమేల్ ఆఫ్ రీప్రోటీ ఏజ్ లైక్ చైల్డ్ బేరింగ్ పొటెన్షియల్ ఆర్ విల్లింగ్ టు బికమ్ ప్రెగ్నెంట్ డిసైరింగ్ టు బికమ్ ప్రెగ్నెంట్ ఆర్ రీప్రోటీ ఏజ్ గ్రూప్ ఫీమేల్స్ విచ్ మీన్స్ దే ఆర్ ఇన్ ద చైల్డ్ బేరింగ్ ఏజ్ సో వాట్ ఆర్ ద డ్రగ్స్ ఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు చూస్ ఇఫ్ ద విమెన్ ఇస్ ఆఫ్ చైల్డ్ బేరింగ్ ఏజ్ చైల్డ్ బేరింగ్ పొటెన్షియల్ ఆర్ దే వాంట్ టు బికమ్ ప్రెగ్నెంట్ ఇన్ దిస్ కేస్ ద ఫస్ట్ లైన్ డ్రగ్స్ విల్ బీ ద టూ ఎల్స్ సో హౌ టు రిమెంబర్ దాట్ ద టూ ఎల్స్ హెల్ప్ ఇన్ లవ్ మేకింగ్ ఓకే చైల్డ్ బేరింగ్ what are the two l's that are going to help in love making child bearing one is levetiracetam second is lamotrigine correct the two l's we know that these are considered the first line drugs in patient who is a female of child bearing age group second line so what is the second line drug ఆక్స్ కార్బెజెపెన్ దిస్ ఆల్సో కన్సిడర్ టు బి రిలేటివ్లీ ఓకే బట్ వాట్ హ్యాస్ టు బి అవాయిడెడ్ కార్బెజెపెన్ హ్యాస్ టు బి అవాయిడెడ్ ద ఫీనో టూ పీస్ హ్యాస్ టు బి అవాయిడెడ్ ఫినటాయిన్ అండ్ ఫీనో బార్బిటోన్ ఫినటాయిన్ అండ్ ఫీనో బార్బిటోన్ షుడ్ బి అవాయిడెడ్ టోపిరమేట్ బెటెట్ అవాయిడ్ బికాస్ దీస్ హ్యావ్ లాట్ ఆఫ్ అదర్ ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ అండ్ వ్యాల్పరేట్ హ్యాస్ టు బి అవాయిడెడ్ ఇన్ఫ్యాక్ట్ ఇఫ్ సంబడి ఆస్క్ యూ విచ్ ఈస్ ద యాంటీప్లెప్టిక్ డ్రగ్ విత్ మ్యాక్సిమమ్ టెరటోజెనిక్ పొటెన్షియల్ ఇట్ ఇస్ వ్యాల్పరేట్ maximum teratogenic potential maximum to maximum teratogenic potential it's going to be valproate correct valproate maximum teratogenic potential okay so these are some of the choices of the drugs but any syndrome okay talk about any syndrome for that matters like uh, lennox gastrit syndrome or any childhood epilepsy syndrome close your eyes and go for valproate most of the time the answer will be valproate with few exceptions like absence is we are going to opt for ethosuximide or probably Uh, some other uh, issues like infantile spasms okay we are going to choose probably acth or corticosteroids you know that so very few exceptions infantile spasms or other is called as west syndrome okay we are going to use acth or steroids so when it comes to absence is ethosuximide for most of the other childhood epilepsy syndromes like close eyes and usually go for valproate most of the time it will be correct okay that's about the choice of antiepileptic drugs and seizures now coming to the fourth question this is a very important question again it is based on uh, status epilepticus so 38 year old man with history of seizure disorder presents with generalized convulsive status epilepticus this stands for the usual generalized convulsive form of status epilepticus he had been having persistent seizure activity for 20 minutes when uh, ems emergency medical services was activated he was given lorazepam 8 mg iv on arrival in the er 20 minutes later he threw another seizure vital temperature is 39.2 degrees celsius which means he is having fever so remember usually most of the patients who are having um what to say status epilepticus may have temperature because of the increase in muscle activity fever is very very common during seizures so don't take that as a sign of meningitis or anything else so bp is 192 by 92 mm of mercury heart rate is 158 this indicates autonomic instability and the respiratory rate is uh, 38 breaths per minute spo2 is 95 each of the following is the next step in the management they have already given lorazepam what you have to do next how will you manage what is the next step the actual right answer for this question is going to be phosphonatine okay so that's the right answer right answer is option a so let me tell you the algorithm for management of status epilepticus first of all definition of status epilepticus seizure lasting for at least 5 minutes or you have got at least two seizures without like gaining consciousness without gaining consciousness in between the seizure episodes seizure lasting for more than 5 minutes or two or more seizures without gaining consciousness in between so here the patient has a seizure activity for 20 minutes almost so that's the status epilepticus number one anything more than five minutes is status and at the same time he got another episode okay he, was, he got another episode 20 minutes later he threw another seizure which means he didn't gain consciousness but he got another seizure so that's also indicating that this patient is probably having a status epilepticus which is a kind of a 
emergency situation. What do you have to do? So in state receptor, because the first line drug is going to be an IV benzodiazepine. Okay, that's the first line drug. You have to use IV benzodiazepine. So what is the first choice IV benzodiazepine? You are going to use either lorazepam, you can use midazolam, or you can use diazepam. Any one of these three drugs can be used. Either lorazepam or midazolam or diazepam. Or even clonazepam also can be used, but it's not available in India. So the usual dose of lorazepam is 4 milligram or 8 milligram. That's the dose of lorazepam that we use. Midazolam dose is 0.2 milligram per kilogram. But remember here we are going to use as IV bolus. That's a very important point. You, mi you might ask me a question that uh, midazolam can be started later also. Then what is the difference between that midazolam that I'll start later and this midazolam? Here the midazolam is really used as IV bolus. Okay, I'm going to use it as an IV bolus. And remember, any one of these drugs only should be used, not both the drugs. Only any one of these drugs. Already, if you use lorazepam, just continue with lorazepam. Okay, if the patient seizure is still not responding, then go to the next step. So you have to start with some IV antiepileptic drug. So what are the available IV antiepileptic drugs? If you want to know the lorazepam dose, it's 0.1 milligram per kilogram. Midazolam dose is going to be 0.2 milligram per kilogram. And uh, clonazepam dose will be approximately 0 0.015 milligram per kilogram if you have it. Okay, then come to IV anti-epileptic drug. So what are the anti-epileptic drugs that you can try? Either phenytoin, either phenytoin or you can use phosphenytoin. The only advantage of phosphenytoin is the fact that it can be given rapidly. So phenytoin cannot be given rapidly because high risk of thrombophytes. So you have to infuse over a period of 20 or 30 minutes. You have to give slowly. But phosphenytoin, you can induce rapidly. The dose of phenytoin or phosphenytoin will be 20 milligram per kilogram. Or you can give levetiracetam. Levetiracetam. Or alternatively, you can use valparate, I valparate. Again, any one is what you're going to try usually. Any one of these drugs you're going to try. Either phenytoin or phosphenytoin or levetiracetam or valparate. So look at our patient, that's the second line. Look at our patient. Our patient, they have given a benzodiazepine already. They are stuck on to lorazepam. So I'm not going to use midazolam again before using an IV antiepileptic drug. So these are our late stages, other options. So the best option in this patient is IV antiepileptic drug as a next option. That could be phosphenytoin, phenytoin, levetiracetam or valparate. So in that question, the answer will be phosphenytoin. So then after this, you have to see what is the seizure type. What is the seizure type? So seizure type can be generalized convulsive status epilepticus or it could be focal status epilepticus. It could be focal seizures, okay, focal complex seizures, focal status epilepticus. So this is the most common situation that I'm going to encounter. It's called generalized convulsive status epilepticus. It's more dangerous where like the patient will be keeping on throwing seizures, okay. So there's another entity, but you need to be aware of that's called as non-convulsive status epilepticus. Even that will be managed in the same fashion only. So be aware of that. So non-convulsive status epilepticus is an EEG diagnosis. EEG diagnosis. This is called as subtle status epilepticus. Other name for non-convulsive status epilepticus is subtle status epilepticus. Patients can have subtle seizures in the sense there won't be muscle jerking, but the EEG activity will be like that of seizures and epilepsy. So that's called as non-convulsive or subtle status epilepticus. But what you see on the outside is generalized convulsive status epilepticus. So how you are going to manage these entities, GCSE or non-convulsive status epilepticus? You have to go for other uh, CNS suppressants like IV midazolam. IV midazolam or I'm going to use IV propofol. IV propofol. I have to induce general anesthesia. IV propofol. This is the next step. If it's a generalized convulsive status epilepticus or non-convulsive status epilepticus. So remember here, I'm going to start continuous infusion. That's a very important point. I'm going to start with continuous infusion. Initially, if I try midazolam, that midazolam will be a bolus. Okay, that's different. But here, I'm going to start with continuous infusion. That is why, because I'm trying to induce general anesthesia, it's important that I have to intubate the patient. That's a very important step. Intubate the patient. Because you are intubating, you are going to paralyze the patient. So if you paralyze the patient, what will happen? The generalized convulsive status epilepticus may become a non-convulsive status epilepticus, right? So if you paralyze the patient, your GCSE becomes what? Non-convulsive status epilepticus. Paralysis doesn't mean the 
seizures have stopped. The brain can still throw seizures, but the muscle activity is lost. That's all. So that's the reason if you are intubating, always go for a continuous EEG monitoring. That's very, very important. If you don't go for continuous EEG monitoring, you will miss out on the non-convulsive status epilepticus part. And many studies have proved that a patient who's coming with a generalized convulsive status epilepticus, over time, it will become non-convulsive status epilepticus. It will become subtle status, which means the signs will slowly disappear. Even if you don't paralyze them, they cannot keep on throwing seizures for like days together or hours together. After 45 minutes or one hour, invariably most of the generalized status epilepticus will become a non-convulsive form. That is why this continuous EG monitoring is almost always mandatory. That's very important. So I'm going to start with continuous infusion of IV midazolam or propofol. So still, if it's not working, the next step will be to start with uh, um, pheno, I mean, thiopentone sodium. Thiopentone, you can try this as an option. That's called as pentobarbital in certain textbooks or we can call it as thiopentone. It's a barbiturate derivative, thiopentone or pentobarbital. And still, if the patient is not responding, we have plenty of other options. What are the other options? You can try uh, uh, volatile anesthetics, volatile GA. Volatile GA, like you can try isoflurane, desflurane, ketamine. So depending on the situation, you can try volatile general anesthesia. Or you can try some surgical approaches. Surgical approaches, depending again, depending on the indication, you can try, uh, if there is a mesial temporal sclerosis, you can try resection of that area, removal of that area. You can try electroconvulsive therapy in some patients. You can try vagal nerve stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So many interventional surgical options are there. Or you can try more medications more medicines, more medicines can be tried. More medicines can be tried. What are the more medicines? There are some medicines which have some anti-epileptic property like lignocaine, verapamil. See, remember gabapentin and pregabapentin is also calcium channel blockers, right? So verapamil may also work in some situations. Ketogenic diet, brain depends on glucose, isn't it? If you give ketogenic diet, seizures might stop. Okay, because the brain will be depleted of glucose and especially the highly active areas like seizure prone areas will be like uh, reducing their activity. Or we can try immunomodulation with IVIG or maybe other immunosuppression depending on what the background diagnosis. These are the other options. Okay, if it's going to be focal status epilepticus, you can try more IV antiepileptic drugs. You can add more IV antileptic drugs before going for gaseous type of, I mean, uh, well, I mean, uh, inducing general anesthesia with uh, propofol or midazolam. Then probably you can try this one. So that's what the guidelines are suggesting. In case if it's a focal status epilepticus, you can try more IV antileptic drugs. Like, I mean, if you already tried phosphonatoin, then probably you could have tried levetiracetam or you can add valparate. Okay, or you can add phenotoin, so something. So more IV antileptic drugs you can try and then you can go for this protocol. But in exam, most of the time you're going to follow the generalized convulsive status epilepticus protocol only. That's very, very important. Step one, IV benzodiazepine. Step two, IV antileptic drug. Step three, inducing IV general anesthesia with midazolam or propofol. Step four, thiopentone. Step five, other medications like general anesthesia. I mean, volatile general anesthesia. So, midazolam, if I ask infusion, that will come under what? That will come under step 3. Thiopentone, it would have come under step 4. Isoflurane, it's a step 5. Phosphenatoin is basically step 2 in this patient. That's why that is the right answer. Phosphenatoin is step 2. Why this is step 2? Because already they have tried IV benzodiazepine bolus shot that is step one so this is stepwise protocol that's how I, I frame this question basically so step one IV benzer has been step two IV antileptic step three continuous infusion of IV midazolam or propofol step four is thiopentone step five is going to be your gaseous general anesthesia so now I think you'll be able to understand this question see if you go to Harrison you will understand so this is exact same thing that's given in Harrison the same protocol so these questions are going to come in the same exact manner only. So that's it. Let us move on to the next question. Hope you understand that. Okay, now coming to the um, different, I mean, stroke localization. So you have a 46 year old male, it's an easy one. 46 year old male presents to the emergency room with the acute onset of ataxia. Neurological examination shows loss of pain and temperature sensation from the face on the left side and loss of pain and temperature on the right side of the body. 
You also has dysarthria, dysphagia, diminished gag reflex, ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis. On the left, what is the most likely diagnosis? So, so, so simple. Isn't it? So, what is the diagnosis? It's simple and straightforward. This is basically a Wallenberg syndrome. That's it. This is lateral medullary syndrome. Wallenberg. So trust me, in exam, they will ask you one of these syndromes only. I mean, they won't ask you like uh, lateral pontine, medial medullary, Weber, very rare to ask in exam. Generally, they don't do that. I don't know why. If you look at, I'm, again, I'm a believer of the last few years of question papers. So if you look at the last five years papers, they have not an, asked anything more than Wallenberg syndrome. Basically, in one exam, probably they have asked Weber syndrome. Apart from that, I don't see any questions largely on the brainstem strokes. But still, students spend a lot of time to learn this. But I mean, I'm not saying don't learn this, but don't give a lot of time to this. Okay. So if you know that, that's fine. But don't waste a lot of time on this because the last five years papers if you see they have not asked much questions on other stroke syndromes apart from lateral medullary syndrome they have asked only on lateral medullary syndrome or wallenberg syndrome so how to localize so first of all uh, you need to know whether it's an anterior circulation stroke or posterior circulation stroke what are the arteries in anterior circulation i'll just tell you some important points that's it that's more than enough so anterior circulation stroke number one you're going to have i mean first we'll split into two so i'll tell you only the important points so when you want to localize the stroke, only follow this like pathway, whatever I'm going to tell. So see whether it is anterior circulation or whether it is posterior circulation. Or maybe before that, we can say whether it's large vessel or small vessel. Large vessel stroke or we can call it as a small vessel stroke. That's a better way. Small vessel stroke. Okay. If it's a large vessel stroke, the next step will be to see whether it is anterior circulation or posterior circulation sorry for the jerk i think my phone i was seeing your comments my phone suddenly like fell down so that's why the jerk came okay so anterior circulation and posterior circulation so what are the anterior circulation vessels we have vertebral artery sorry <laughs> oh my god so we have internal carotid artery we have anterior cerebral artery and we have middle cerebral artery okay so this is the anterior circulation vessels so what will be the key feature? So only one feature, internal carotid artery, to tell that the stroke is there, it's located in internal carotid artery. It is the ipsilateral blindness, vision loss. If you have a complete ipsilateral blindness, the only place where you can localize the stroke is internal carotid artery. No way you can localize anywhere else. MCA, ACA can result in visual field defects like homonymous hemianopia or quadrantinopias, but they can't cause ipsilateral vision loss ipsilateral complete blindness okay that is the key point okay so internal carotid artery second so what about anterior cerebral artery so always look for two things aca anterior cerebral artery antisocial behavior look for this antisocial a for a antisocial behavior for anterior cerebral artery because of involvement of prefrontal cortex second Look for leg related problems, leg related problems like gait apraxia, leg paralysis predominantly, leg involvement more than arm face involvement. Patient can have hemiparesis, but leg predominantly involved, feet predominantly involved. Think about ACA, leg problems, predominantly leg problems, ACA. What about MCA? Yes, then urinary incontinence, urinary incontinence because of involvement of paracentral lobule. That's correct, urinary incontinence. These are the features of ACA. And they can ask release reflexes also. I don't think whether it's important or not, but release reflexes. So what about MCA, middle cerebral artery? You're going to have hemiparesis of arms and face predominantly. Arm and face will be involved. Arm and face weakness, more than the leg weakness. And generally, feet will be spared. If it's a pure MCA, then feet will be spared. Okay, that's a point. Okay, arm face involvement. Predominantly, feet will be spared. That is MCA. And visual field defects can occur in anything. So usually visual field defects will occur in MCA territory stroke only. And many times patient will have aphasia in MCA stroke only. MCA stroke only are going to get aphasia. And you know that aphasia is going to occur with left-sided strokes, not right-sided strokes because 
only dominant hemispherical lesions are going to produce aphasia non dominant hemispherical lesions will not result in aphasia that's it as simple as that so aphasia so it could be either what brocas or it could be vernicus depending on the area that's involved it could be expressive or it could be receptive aphasia but aphasias can occur only on left side and yes if it's right sided they can have hemi neglect or they can have other problems like constriction apraxia and so on they can have plenty of other problems like jasmine syndrome i don't have time right now to discuss all those things what about only the clues crumbs i we need to know so what about posterior circulation if it's a posterior circulation all you need to know is whether the problem is in the pca or the problem is in the mm, basilar or problem is in the vertebral artery okay only three things you need to know problem is in the pca or problem is in the basilar artery or problem is in the vertebral artery because th these are three major vessels that constitute the posterior circulation if it's the pca so what are you going to think predominantly you will have one important clue that is contralateral homonymous hemianopia contralateral homonymous hemianopia hemianopia with macular sparing okay that's the key that word macular sparing is going to be the key contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing that is pca if it's bilateral pca in fact it will result in anton syndrome that's called cortical blindness and pca in fox can also result in thalamic syndromes so how will you pick up thalamic syndromes in exam whenever you see a stroke causing abnormal sensations like pain burning so they can be numbness but the patient will also have some abnormal sensations like pain burning sensation that is thalamic stroke so thalamic syndromes also usually due to pca territory infarcts only and right pca territory infarcts can produce a characteristic finding called as prosopagnosia where the patient will not be able to remember faces i think every one of you will be aware of that prosopagnosia inability to remember faces this can occur with right pca infarcts non dominant pca infarcts okay what about basilar artery basilar artery tend to produce two syndromes one is called as locked in syndrome locked in syndrome second one is going to be top of basilar syndrome this is what is more important okay your millard gabler and all is not at all important basically for exams so one is locked in syndrome and second is top of basilar so what is locked in state locked in state is like a like pseudo coma like state but the patient is very conscious here so you can imagine the uh, munna bai mbbs character that anand sir anand ji is there no munna bai mbbs so that character you can remember so that's locked in state where the patient is going to be conscious is very conscious you can remember you can see you can hear you can feel you can feel the pain temperature everything the sensations are intact the consciousness is there but you will not be able to react because bilateral seventh nerve palsy lmn type dead face quadriparesis not able to move anything the only thing that they can do is limited vertical movements of the eyeballs that's the only thing they can do no horizontal gaze complete quadriparesis and total loss of facial movements so they look as if they are comatose but only thing is the fact that these patients are conscious and they will have limited vertical eye movements alone so two things vertical eye movements limited conscious patients and pupils may react to light so these are the important things about locked in syndrome top of basilar is different so that's a basilar top occlusion where the patient will present with altered mental status typically they use a uh, a word called dream like state altered mental status or dream like state patient will have visual hallucinations visual hallucinations ophthalmoplegia because of certain areas of midbrain will be involved ophthalmoplegia will be there ophthalmoplegia will be there okay and uh, patients will have uh, memory loss okay these are the features patients will have memory loss these are the features of top of basilar syndrome so in exam the straightforward giveaway is going to be the dream like state if they mention something called dream like state okay so think about top of basilar syndrome what about vertebral artery vertebral artery is going to result in wallenberg syndrome even though it's called as pica syndrome but the most common cause of wallenberg syndrome is vertebral artery vertebral artery occlusion so what is wallenberg syndrome the crossed lesion okay the cross lesion very very characteristic so what is the cross lesion you're going to get something like this when you get something like this right it's a cross lesion so where the patient will have sensory loss on the left side of the face i mean one side of the face and other side of the body so ipsilateral pain and temperature loss in the face because of involvement of spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve on the ipsilateral side and there will be contralateral loss of 
pain and temperature in the body that is because of involvement of spinothalamic tract and patient will also have additional ipsilateral hornus syndrome same side ipsilateral hornus syndrome where there will be ptosis meiosis anhydrosis uh, loss of ciliospinal reflex and apparent enophthalmos and ipsilateral cerebellar features like hypotonia most of the time they fool you with hypotonia because you might think whenever there is hypotonia you will think it's probably a corticospinal tract involvement no no corticospinal tract involvement and weakness will produce hypertonia only not hypotonia but cerebellar problems can produce hypotonia apart from ataxia and nystagmus and all so ipsilateral cerebellar signs will be there and along with that what what is the one thing that's going to tell you it's Wallenberg syndrome is the fact that these patients will be having ninth and 10th nerve palsy that is more important this is the one that's going to tell you it is Wallenberg syndrome for sure 9th and 10th nerve. So what is 9th and 10th nerve involvement? It's going to result in dysphagia because these nerves are going to control the bulbar muscles. Dysphagia, dysarthria, voice production will be affected, dysphonia. And most importantly, they will have hiccups. That's very important. Dysarthria, dysphagia, okay? Then dysphonia. And most of these patients, they will have recurrent hiccups. That's a very, very important point, okay? Recurrent hiccups. And intractable hip hiccups is one of the key feature of Wallenberg syndrome. I don't know, many people don't like remember that, but that's a very, very important feature. Intractable hiccups in Wallenberg syndrome. It's very classic of Wallenberg. So now this is how you're going to like classify like and localize the stroke basically. So if it's a small vessel occlusion, what are you going to see? So very importantly, small vessels are going to supply the subcortical area. So it's going to be a subcortical stroke subcortical stroke for example the stroke might be located in the internal capsule but what will be the key feature so number one no cortical symptoms and signs if the stroke is subcortical you are not going to develop cortical symptoms and signs in the sense patient will not have the ace the aphasia agnosia apraxia acalculia okay anomia these features won't be there whatever you call it as with ace isn't it in your cns so no cortical symptoms and signs Number one, subcortical stroke. Number two, no brainstem signs. That's very, very important. If it if there are brainstem signs, then it indicates brainstem stroke, not a small vessel stroke. Okay, brainstem signs, since we are talking about cross lesions, right? So what is the best example of a cross lesion? So this is an example of a cross lesion. If this is there, you're going to talk about brainstem stroke. Okay. So cortical, subcortical stroke means you should not have cortical symptoms and signs. There won't be usually altered mental status. Patient will be all right. The sensation and the sensorium will be clear. Higher mental functions will be intact usually. And brainstem signs will not be there. But there will be a stroke. Okay, that is small vessel stroke, subcortical stroke. Because small vessels don't supply the cortex. They are going to supply the subcortical areas only. Previously, these strokes are also called as lacunar strokes. Lacunar strokes. They will ask you what is the most common reason, I mean, what's, what's the most common vessel that's affected with small vessel stroke? It's the lenticlostride branches. Lenticlostride branches can originate from middle cerebral artery, they can originate from anterior cerebral artery, they can originate from internal carotid artery, but most commonly, lenticlostride branches of the middle cerebral artery only will be commonly involved, okay? Lenticlostride branches of middle cerebral artery. That's the one that's going to commonly produce small vessel strokes or otherwise we're going to call it as lacunar strokes. So lacuna stroke means there will be small lacunes because of the stroke in that area. It look like black holes in that area. Clear. And uh, that's it. So we have done about localization. So lateral pontine syndrome and lateral medullary syndrome will be the same. Okay. Almost same features. The only differentiation is the cranial nerve involvement. That's all. So if the cranial nerve involved is 7. Okay. Element 7. Ipsilateral element 7. That is lateral pontine syndrome. If, it, if the cranial nerve involved is ipsilateral element 9 and 10, the bulbar muscles we are talking about, that is lateral medullary syndrome. That's the only difference, okay, between lateral pontine syndrome and lateral medullary syndrome. So every other feature will be same. Ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature in the face, contralateral loss of pain and temperature in the body, ipsilateral horner, ipsilateral cerebellar symptoms, everything will be the same. The only difference is if the cranial nerve involved is 9, 10 element, it is Wallenberg. If the cranial nerve involved is 7, then it's lateral pontine. That's it. Lateral middle, lateral pontine. Lateral pontine syndrome is also called as Mary Fox disease. Mary Fox disease. You know, in Wallenberg syndrome, vertebral artery is more commonly involved than pica, but both are important for exams. In Mary Fox disease, lateral pontine syndrome, it's going to be ICA, that is anterior inferior cerebral artery. That's the artery of occlusion. 
Middle medullary syndrome, it's called as Digerin's antibulba syndrome. Here, the crinoline involved will be crinoline number 12. That will be ipsilateral and there will be contralateral hemiparesis. Contralateral hemiparesis and the artery that will be involved is going to be medial medullary, ah, sorry, uh, anterior spinal artery. Okay, that will be involved. But it's a very, very rare syndrome. So, ipsilateral 12th you know, with contralateral hemiparesis is medial medullary syndrome. The artery involved is going to be anterior spinal artery. Weber syndrome was asked once in exams. It's ipsilateral cranial number 3 plus contralateral hemiparesis. That's Weber syndrome. Artery involved is going to be the P1 segment of the PCA. Okay, P1 segment of the PCA. That's the artery involved. Remember, uh, if you talk about this contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macula sparing, this is due to P P2 segment of the PCA. This is due to P2 segment of the PCA, not P1 segment. So that's a large artery problem. P1 PCA will result in midbrain syndromes like Weber syndrome. So if at all they're going to ask, they're going to ask one of these four syndromes only. They're not going to ask anything more than this. But in that, the lateral medullary syndrome is the most important. Don't forget the hiccups in lateral medullary syndrome. How to localize it? That's how. Large, small. So how to tell small? No cortical signs, no brainstem signs. Small vessel stroke, lacuna stroke. Usually due to lenticulostrite occlusions. Any cortical symptoms and sign, brainstem sign, it's going to be large vessel stroke. So how will you split anterior posterior and anterior ICA, vision loss, ACA, gait problems, urinary incontinence, antisocial behavior, release reflexes, MCA, predominantly arm and face problems, competitive leg problems, aphasia, visual field defects, okay, then uh, constriction apraxia, hemi neglect. So these are all characteristic features of MCA strokes, just man syndrome, all MCA strokes. And coming to the other side, posterior circulation stroke, look for the brainstem signs. If it's not there, think about contralateral homonymous MFI, that macular sparing. If it's there, it's PCA. If it's not there, look for like sensory changes, like burning pain and all. If it's there, then it's going to be thalamic syndrome. It's also due to PCA only. Then come down in the brainstem. All you need to know is the basilar or vertebral. If it's basilar, top of basilar and locked in syndrome. Locked in means you're talk, going to talk about that Munabai BBS character Ananji. If it is not the think about top of basilar syndrome, top of basilar means you're going to have altered mental state, the dreamlike state. That will be the clue in exam. And coming down, you're going to have uh, vertebral artery involvement, Wallenberg syndrome, typical that hiccups, don't forget. And you're going to have 9th and 10th now, uh, LMN involvement. Apart from that, uh, the sensory loss that's crossed, like face one side and body on other side. That's it. It's done. <sighs> now let us move on to question number six. So you have a 25 year old F1 driver. Actually, this is one of my own cases. That's why I've mentioned this. This is going to tell you that it's a special kind of a stroke. So you have 25 year old F1 driver. It's one of, one of my cases that I've portrayed here. So complaints of neck pain following a race. He had a race and he has a neck pain. Three days later, he presents with left sided facial numbness. Okay, as well as numbness across the right upper limb and lower limb. Okay, left pupil is much smaller than the right. And there's a partial ptosis on the left. Eye movements are normal. Otherwise, the, there's no ophthalmoplegia. Power coordination reflexes, everything is normal. What is the gold standard? Brain imaging modality to find out the primary diagnosis. Who's going to answer? MRI brain, cartilage artery Doppler, EEG, CT angiogram of the head and the neck. First of all, you need to know what is the primary diagnosis over here. I would say that primary diagnosis here is a dissection. Primary diagnosis here is a dissection. Okay, it's a special kind of stroke, can be asked in exams. It's a dissection basically. So dissection typically affects the extracranial vessels, but it can extend intracranially. The best example who died of dissection, Phil Hughes, 63 not out in 2015. He died in an Australian Sheffield Trophy match, in a domestic match due to a bouncer bowled by someone called as Sean Abbott. It hit the side of the neck and he had an IC dissection and it progressed rapidly into the brain and he died. He collapsed on spot. Yes, correct. Okay, everyone remembers that, right? So everyone who knows cricket will know that, that Phil Hughes is 63 not out. Even now we call him like that, even though he's in heaven right now. So dissection, okay? That's a very important thing. So what about dissection? Whenever there is dissection, you can have 2H, 2H, this is very important, 2H. So what are the two H's? One is history of trauma, very, very commonly, either a direct trauma or indirect trauma. This trauma can be direct or this trauma can be indirect most of the time, history of trauma. And where trauma, trauma to the neck, trauma to the neck, 
okay it could be direct or indirect so indirect trauma is something like this a f1 car driver a racing driver or probably someone who is involved in racing so or maybe you are going in some trampoline okay jumping up and down so these are examples of direct and indirect trauma to the neck and second h hornus whenever in exam they give painful horner it's equal to ic dissection internal carotid dissection unless put otherwise look for the stereotypical word hornus painful hornus it's equal to ic dissection unless put otherwise hornus syndrome okay so these are the two h's that you need to know if it is there it is dissection unless put otherwise so there are two vessels that can be dissected it could be a vertical artery di vertebral artery dissection or it could be internal carotid artery dissection but what is more common it's going to be internal carotid artery dissection that's going to be more common so just look for where the pain is having valenberg like features or not valenberg like features if the pain is having valenberg like features okay think about vertebral artery dissection the patient does not have valenberg like features the pain is having more of hemiparesis remember valenberg never has hemiparesis you would have seen already in the previous question okay the lateral syndromes when you talk about lateral 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 syndromes no hemiparesis no hemiparesis that's very very important if they ask you which of the following cannot occur in a lateral syndrome pontine or medullary it is hemiparesis because the motor tracts are medial how to remember that m m motor medial okay they not lateral medial motor okay clear so if you are going to have no motor problems valenberg like picture okay think about vertebral artery dissection if it's not valenberg like picture think about ic dissection that's it not valenberg like ic they may have hemiparesis aphasia so many things okay so they can have vision loss so many things they can have so that's different okay now what this patient is having this patient is having a vertebral artery dissection or an internal carotid artery dissection look this patient is having left sided pain and temperature loss and right upper and lower limb pain and temperature loss and left side pupil is small which means pain is having left horner syndrome and patient is having ptosis of the left side that's also means it's a horner syndrome ptosis meiosis anhedrosis loss of ciliary spinal reflex it's horner okay the power is normal power coordination is normal which means it is not hemiparesis patient is not having hemiparesis so which means this patient is basically suffering from vertebral artery dissection vertebral artery dissection that's what this patient is suffering from vertebral artery dissection so here it's a typical valenberg like picture okay patient is having sensory loss no hemiparesis hornus picture valenberg like picture okay so it's a vertebral artery dissection very likely so what is that investigation of choice to confirm the primary diagnosis it is ct angiogram of the head and neck mri can show the stroke but it will not tell the primary diagnosis carotid artery doppler the problem is vertebral artery dissection why you want to do a carotid artery doppler so that's not going to help in any way eg again it's for seizures not for you so the right answer for this question is option d that is ct angiogram of the head and neck that's going to tell you the primary diagnosis if they ask you treatment for dissection treatment for dissection it's going to be anticoagulation but only if the dissection has not crossed the dura mater if the dissection once it goes into the dura mater risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage is very high i'm not going to use anticoagulation i'll use only aspirin in case if the dissection has not extended into the dura mater if there is no intradural extension then anticoagulation will be the treatment of choice that's what will be asked in exams dissection anticoagulation if they have given the details with regards to intradural or not based on that you can decide intradural don't use anticoagulation if it's not having intradural extension you can use anticoagulation no problem next question one question based on your clinical understanding so a patient present with diplopia identify the injured nerve based on the test given in the picture they are doing some testing over here and i want to find out what nerve is injured what nerve is injured see i don't have time to discuss the entire thing about diplopia that's a huge topic because each and every topic in cns is huge technically i cannot discuss everything so what i'm going to Uh, answer here so it's trochlear oculomotor abducens or facial nerve with abducens now the right answer for this question is simple straightforward it's trochlear now that's it so what is the test that they are doing here that's called as bielsowski sign that's called as bielsowski test 
Bielsowski test. That's what they're doing here. That's called as Bielsowski test. So what is Bielsowski test or what do you mean by Bielsowski sign? So this is done for superior oblique palsy. Superior oblique palsy. So if in case if it's superior oblique palsy, so what is the nerve that will be injured? It's a fourth nerve. So what is the function of superior oblique? We know. So we have a mnemonic for that. So I don't know. I'm not a big believer of mnemonics, but these are cool mnemonics. I have something called solid. This is a mnemonic I remember. You can remember whatever mnemonics you want. Of that teachers would have taught you better. But nevertheless, solid. Superior oblique is going to produce lateral movement of the eyeballs, in torsion of the eyeballs, and they're going to produce depression. And they're going to produce depression. This is the this thing. Lateral movement means you're talking about abduction. Okay, abduction. So lateral deviation, in torsion, depression. So let me tell you. So what is the primary movement? The primary movement is going to be in torsion. This is the primary for superior oblique, in torsion. So you have two eyes. Let us assume this is my left eye. Okay, left eye, right eye. So left superior oblique. If it's parallel, what is the function of left superior oblique? It's going to in tot, in tot. Okay. Let us assume my left superior oblique is paralyzed because of fourth nerve palsy. What happens? My left eye cannot in tot. If my left eye cannot intort, what happens? It extorts because of overaction of like your inferior oblique. So now what happens? Now I'm not able to fix the gaze properly. So I'm going to end up with diplopia. So how can I correct that? How can I correct that? I can voluntarily rotate my eyes towards the opposite side. I can voluntarily rotate the eyes towards the opposite side. What happens in this regard? This adjusts a little better because this eye I can adjust anyway. So I can adjust this and I can make it straight so that my vision will be better. So this is called as contralateral head tilt, contralateral head tilt. So clear. So whenever the patient goes for a contralateral head tilt, things will get better. The diplopia will get better. Okay. If they do a ipsilateral head tilt, diplopia will worsen. It's going to ipsilateral head tilt, diplopia will become worse. So look at this. Patient, this patient's diplopia is getting worse. Can you see the alignment of the eyeball? I mean, eyes are much worse on moving the eyes towards the same side. Whichever side they tilt the head, if the diplopia worsens, that is the side of injury. Okay, whichever side they tilt the head and the diplopia worsens, that's the side of injury. So here the patient is tilting towards the right side. And because he's tilting towards the right side, his diplopia is worsening. So which means that should be the side of injury. This patient is having right trochlear injury or right superior oblique injury. Okay, left side is intact. Maybe if he's tilting towards the left side, it'll, it might get better. So they will get better with contralateral head tilt. It will get worse with ipsilateral head tilt. So which side is getting worse when they're tilting? That side is the side of injury. So trochlear injury is most common trauma. Most common reason for trochlear injury is trauma. You, know, you all, I mean, everyone would have mugged up about uh, uh, the so many rules and these things. But in, in reality, like that's for ophthalmologists. We don't do that in reality as clinicians. It's very simple and straightforward things that we look for. The head tilt is always trochlear nerve palsy. Head tilt, trochlear nerve palsy. Head tilt. That's what the examiner will be expecting from you. So trochlear nerve, head tilt, most common trauma. Why? Because trochlear nerve is the thinnest nerve, the most slender nerve going to be affected because of trauma to the orbit commonly. Okay, that's trochlear nerve palsy. Coming to the next question, question number eight, a patient comes to the emergency room with headache, describing it as the worst headache of his life. Initial non-contrast CT shows subarachnoid hemorrhage. So sorry for my English, initial non-contrast CT shows subarachnoid hemorrhage. What is the next step? This is such an easy question. So they have found out subarachnoid hemorrhage. So what is the next step? What are you going to do? What is your answer? Are you going to perform a DSA, digital subtraction angiography? Are you going to perform a lumbar puncture? Are you going to perform a MRI brain? Or are you going to perform a VP shunt? That is ventriculoperitoneal shunt. So you know, like how to suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage whenever the patient is having uh, acute severe headache. Okay, acute severe headache you're going to think about subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if you're suspecting subarachnoid hemorrhage, so what are the key features, okay? So number one, acute severe headache. It could be the worst headache of the patient's life or it could be 
thunder clap headache or whatever it is acute severe headache that's the key feature suspecting subarachnoid next step ncct that's the next step if ncct is positive what are going to do next step you have to localize where the aneurysm is so for that you need to do a ct angiogram or alternatively you can do a digital subtraction angiogram or you can do a mr angiogram but some angiogram modality is very very important so in reality we perform ct angiogram commonly because it's available everywhere but you can do a dsa or mra also dsa in fact is thought to be the gold standard imaging modality if ncct is negative because a clinical suspicion is high straight away cannot rule out because 10 percent of the cases of subarachnoid image can be negative on ncct so what you need to do is you have to do lumbar puncture in this situation to bruise anthochromia if lumbar puncture is positive then probably which means if it's showing xanthochromia or some other signs of subarachnoid hemorrhage like a bloody tap then probably you can do an angiographic technique if lumbar puncture is negative you can rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage if it's completely clear and normal you can rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage now once you have localized the aneurysm you have to start proceeding with the treatment so what are the two treatment options that you need to know so most of the treatment is to reduce or prevent the complications most of the treatment that we do in subarachnoid hemorrhage is to either reduce or prevent the development of future complications so what are the three complications one is going to be your uh, re-bleeding re-bleeding re-rupture of the aneurysm catastrophic complication risk mortality if it re-ruptures is going to be more than 70 80 percent second vasospasm which commonly occurs and one of the most common cause of death in patients subarachnoid hemorrhage number three hydrocephalus because this blood is going to occlude your areas of csf absorption okay you can result in hydrocephalus how will you tackle each and everything re-bleeding you can tackle by either clipping the aneurysm that's called aneurysmal clip or by coiling the aneurysm that's called endovascular coiling but in exam they ask you what to prefer endovascular coiling but again it depends on so many features certain aneurysms cannot be coiled so it, it you have to go for clipping only advantage of uh, coiling is like it is endovascular procedure you can do without opening the skull craniotomy but clipping has to be done by opening the skull that's craniotomy vasospasm drug of choice is nimodipine everyone knows that so this is something that i've been taught by so many people so just let me write that so it's a calcium channel blocker exclusively approved for the purpose of your subarachnoid hemorrhage treatment hydrocephalus vp shunt that's all so these are the three things that you need to do okay so this is how you treat them so technically mri brain is not going to help in any way lumbar puncture only if the ncct is negative be patient only as a part of treatment right answer for this question is option a that is dsa that is digital subtraction angiography coming to ninth question you have an 80 year old man who's investigated for progressive cognitive impairment which of the following is the more feature that is going to be most suggestive of levy body dementia we're talking about levy body dementia most suggestive of levy body dementia disinhibition emotional ability uh, neuroleptic sensitivity urinary incontinence so which is going to tell you that it is lbd or levy body dementia okay answer is neuroleptic sensitivity okay so that's the one that's going to tell you it is levy body dementia that's very very important point okay so disinhibition is a feature of frontotemporal dementia emotional ability is also a feature of frontotemporal dementia urinary incontinence is a feature of normal pressure hydrocephalus when it comes to dementia okay so the right answer for this question is going to be option c so i mean let me tell you only the key features alzheimer disease so simply very elderly people like 60s 70s or even 80s memory loss that's the most important memory loss without that you cannot diagnose alzheimer disease elderly memory loss very chronic history very chronic years and decades together memory loss very old people memory loss chronic history think about alzheimer disease what about frontotemporal dementia not so elderly relatively young like 50s maybe so still they can be older but not so older like alzheimer disease relatively young people but having like emotional ability emotional issues emotional problems like and disinhibition antisocial behavior and speech related problems speech problems okay they're not able to speak properly speech related problems frontotemporal dementia then third we have another dementia called as uh, levy body dementia so lbd or dlb dementia with levy bodies 
fluctuating consciousness fluctuating consciousness so it's it's something that can mimic delirium okay you know that fluctuating consciousness never a feature of dementia that's what I studied in psychiatry but one dementia that can mimic delirium is levy body dementia fluctuating consciousness feature of delirium can be seen in levy body dementia second visual hallucinations these are the keywords visual hallucinations third you're going to see something called as neuroleptic sensitivity that's correct neuroleptic sensitivity why and parkinson features pd features parkinson disease features like bradykinesia so because these patients are having levy bodies they will be having parkinsonian features like bradykinesia if you give neuroleptic agents what are these agents these are d2 blockers they can worsen the parkinson features and the patient will be completely frozen they will be having extreme sensitive neuroleptics you should not do that so that is LBD, dementia with Levy bodies. And what about NPH normal pressure hydrocephalus? These patients are going to exhibit something called as Hakim's triad. So what is Hakim's triad? They're going to have subcortical dementia. They're going to have urinary incontinence. And they will have something called as gait apraxia. Gait apraxia. Also called as magnetic gait. So what will be the first feature? Gait apraxia. What is the late feature? Urinary incontinence. Dementia comes somewhere in between. So this is normal pressure hydrocephalus. What about Crutzfeld jacob disease? This is also something that's going to cause dementia. In exam, it's very simple, elderly. In the sense, not very elderly. Age will be more than 50. Two clues. One is rapidly progressing dementia plus myoclonus. Okay, rapidly progressing dementia plus myoclonus. Okay, is equal to Crutzfeld, sporadic Crutzfeld jacob disease. Sporadic Crutzfeld jacob disease. So they will ask you predominantly EEG findings. EEG, you will see slow background that's many times asked question you will have a slow background with periodic sharp waves periodic sharp waves okay periodic sharp waves so this is a very very important point okay periodic sharp waves that's the clue okay so that's the eg finding and uh, in mri you will see cortical ribbon this is the feature of Sporadic Crutzfeld Jacob disease, but if it's a variant Crutzfeld Jacob disease, I think radiologists would have taught you that you have something called pulvinar sign, you have something called hockey stick sign, you have plenty of signs that can be seen variant Crutzfeld Jacob disease, but in sporadic, commonest form of Crutzfeld Jacob disease, it's going to be cortical ribboning. And in CSF, you can have 1433 positive, so this is what will be asked in neat exams, but there are plenty of newer tests that have come, like um, shaking induced conversion, or sorry, quaking induced conversion, so that's called real time quake. So what is real-time quick? Real-time quaking induced conversion. Okay, that is the one that has more than 95% sensitivity and more than 95% specificity. That's called RT quick. That's the current test that we prefer for diagnosing Crutzfeld Jacob disease. So not 1433. Even though in exam they will be usually asking only 1433. RT quick stands for quaking induced conversion. Okay, that's for Crutzfeld Jacob disease. That's it. It's done. Most of the important types of dementia and needless to say that you have studied the pharmacology already. So I'm not going to discuss in detail. So going to the 10th question, easy one. A 44 year old male present to your clinic uh, with a six month history of left sided daily headaches. Look at the frontal and retroorbital area. He denies any pain free periods. The headaches are of moderate 5 by 10 severity with unpredictable exacerbations of severe pain going up to 9 out of 10 severity. He describes to you what sounds to you like a left-sided conjunctural injection and lacrimation, which means he's having autonomic features. And alongside the headaches is there. Which of the following is the most likely to aid your diagnosis? Is it 100% oxygen, lumbar puncture, trial of intermethacin, MRI, brain? Okay. So what is going to tell you? The diagnosis. Okay, the right answer for this question is trial of indomethacin. Why? So you know how to diagnose migraine most of the times. So migraine, females, generally bilateral. Migraineous features will be there. Patient will have history of migraineous features like nausea, vomiting, okay, photophobia, phonophobia. So migraineous features will be there typically so usually young females or middle-aged females bilateral pain 
okay pulsatile pain this will be the clue pulsatile pain pounding pulsatile pain migraineous features like nausea plus or minus vomiting phonophobia photophobia will be there and the duration will be typically 4 to 72 hours okay that's the duration more than 4 hours but less than 72 hours this is i mean plus or minus aura not always aura will be there but the most common type of aura will be visual auras in the form of scintillating scotomas most common is visual okay most common type of auras will be visual auras scintillating scotomas that's very very common could be any aura but that's optional because with aura is very rare only without aura is common that's called common migraine so females pulsatile pounding headache bilateral typically migraineous features duration 4 to 7 hours aura most commonly visual migraine acute treatment triptans okay acute treatment always triptans number one triptans 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 alternative will be NSAIDs okay like cuterolac very commonly used in practice NSAIDs we can use promethazin we can use uh, antihistamines so many drugs can be used but these are the two drugs that we commonly use chronic treatment for prophylaxis plenty of drugs are there any drug can be used plenty of drugs any of this beta blockers like propranolol tricyclic antidepressants can be used okay anti-epileptic drugs can be used like topiramate valparate so the most commonly used beta blocker is propranolol most commonly used tca is amitriptyline and we can use anti-epileptic drugs like topiramate that's what i prefer very commonly or you can use valparate anything can be used there is no particular drug of choice with regards to chronic maintenance therapy and many people say yes you can use calcium channel blockers like flunarizin it's available in the brand name called sibelium we commonly use 10 milligram or 20 milligram sibelium in the night okay yes we have newer forms people are talking about the cgrp antagonist arinumab from enazumab okay we have newer forms of CGRP antagonists but I don't know how much will be asked in exams though but we have plenty of options any of these options can be tried it's not a problem at all and what about uh, the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias so we have three forms isn't it one is called cluster headache second is the paroxysmal hemicrania group or we can say like uh, hemicrania group cluster and hemicrania group so cluster is very common in males typically in the 40s and uh, hemicrania group is common in the females okay young females like around 30s and 40s we have two types of hemicrania one is called as paroxysmal hemicrania second is hemicrania continua paroxysmal hemicrania and second is hemicrania continua so how cluster will present typically in the middle of the night in a middle-aged female middle of the night middle-aged female middle of the night middle-aged female sorry middle-aged male middle of the night that's how cluster presents and what are the triggers sleep and alcohol will be a trigger migraine will come down with sleep but cluster headache will actually get aggravated by sleep so patient will be awake they'll be very mad and they'll be roaming here and there that's typical of cluster so yeah eclon has pointed out the mistake i think uh, i've made a mistake yeah it's not bilateral it's unilateral correct correct very sorry for that that's a uh, wrong information actually tension type headache only will be bilateral it's going to be unilateral headache correct most of them it can be bilateral though so you cannot rule out migraine just based on the fact that it's uh uni I mean, bilateral but typically it's unilateral the tension type headache only is the one that's going to be bilateral so sorry for that okay so cluster headache sleep and alcohol they can trigger cluster headaches males middle-aged common okay so coming down okay so what are the other features of cluster headache all these features will all these trigeminal autonomic neuralgias will have ans manner ans involvement autonomic nervous system involvement like conjunctival injection lacrimation that is tearing redness of eyes these are very very common okay autonomic involvement if you think it's a cluster headache how will you treat treatment is going to be acute treatment 100% oxygen or alternative to 100% oxygen triptans alternative is going to be triptans but NSAIDs usually don't work that much 100% oxygen chronic management go for calcium channel blockers verapamil verapamil chronic management verapamil that's it okay chronic management verapamil 100% oxygen Alternative triptans for acute management, chronic management, verapamil, calcium channel blockers. 
Okay, yeah, triptans, you have to go for injectable triptans, like sumatriptan injection, that can be tried. Not oral, will not work that much. Nevertheless, so what about paroxysmal hemicrania? This hemicrania group, how will you differentiate from clustered egg? Because both are going to be very similar. How to differentiate from clustered egg and paroxysmal hemicrania? Only the attacks. Attacks are very, very important. Cluster headache will have like attack duration of around like 180 minutes, like usually it will be 30 to 180 minutes. And they will be lower frequency, like typically maximum 1 to 8 per day. The frequency will be lower, but generally it will be 1 or 2 per day, not more than that. So longer duration, lesser frequency. But paroxysmal hemicrania will be having lesser duration of attack. That's in fact the only way to uh, differentiate between cluster egg and paroxysmal hemicrania, lesser duration. In the sense the duration will be 5 to 30 minutes in general and they'll have more frequent attacks more frequent attacks like it will be around 5 to 30 attacks per day generally it will be like 20 25 attacks that's the usual range so lesser duration more frequent attacks that's paroxysmal hemicrania but otherwise it's clinically impossible to differentiate cluster egg from paroxysmal hemicrania both will look very similar and what about hemicrania continua here the patient will not have like relief in the headache at all at any point. Cluster and paroxysmal at least they will touch the baseline. Here the headache will not touch the baseline at all. It will be like constant headache of some degree. Throughout 24 by 7 they will have constant headache. On top of that they will have superimposed jabs like this. So in the sense there won't be any pain free interval. That's the key word. No pain free interval at all with hemicrania continua. That is the key word. So consistent headache on top of that, there will be worsening, exacerbations, periodic jabs. That is hemicrania continua. Treatment of choice, indomethacin. Indomethacin. That is the treatment of choice. Because this gives a 100% response, 100% response to indomethacin. That's the key point. 100% response to indomethacin. That's why it's the treatment of choice. So, in fact, this can be used to differentiate between cluster headache and hemicrania group in some cases. So what about this patient? Our patient is having a possible hemicrania continua. Our patient is having a possible hemicrania continua. So that's why the answer is going to be trial of indomethacin. If you are having any doubt, 100% oxygen won't work because it's unlikely to be clustered. Lumbar puncture is for uh, your uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage or probably meningitis. You're not going to think about that here. MRI brain is not going to give you any answer for your primary headaches like migraine or cluster headache. Maybe in trigeminal neuralgia, Yes, you can see some findings in the MRI brain. So can you tell me what is the finding that you see in trigeminal neuralgia in MRI? One artery will be compressing on the trigeminal. What is that artery? Anyone? That's the Harrison word. What is that artery that's going to compress on the trigeminal now? Okay, I'll tell you the answer. Superior cerebellar artery. Superior cerebellar artery. Yes, that's correct. Fine, all right. So, an additional point which I want to say with regards to trigeminal neuralgia, the drug of choice for treating trigeminal neuralgia is going to be carbamazepine, right? The drug of choice for treating trigeminal neuralgia is carbamazepine. That's what you need to answer for exams. Okay. Coming to this question, a 60-year-old woman presents with a tremor, which of the following features would suggest diagnosis of essential tremors rather than Parkinson's disease? Difficult initiating movement, tremor is worse following alcohol, unilateral symptoms, tremor is worse when the arms are outstretched. So which is the one that's going to tell you it is essential tremor and not Parkinson's disease. First of all, let us see the Parkinson features. We know the trap features. What are the trap features? Tremors, rigidity, akinesia or bradykinesia and you're going to have uh, something called as um, postural instability. That is Parkinson's disease typically. So essential tremors is different. So how do you differentiate them? Parkinson's disease usually will not have family history generally. Essential tremors patients usually tend to have a strong family history. That's essential tremors. Parkinson's disease uh, tremors will be like not postural. So here the tremors will be postural. That's very key. So postural in the sense like the tremor will increase when the arms are outstretched. And this can be serious trouble because most of the things you do in day to day life are basically going to be done with the arms outstretched, right? So driving, bike or maybe the car or writing. So in most situations, like you're going to outstretch the arms and do the things. So that's why like this could be really, really troublesome, postural tremors, but that's not the case here. Patients can have titubation that is nothing but head tremors. 
But Parkinson's disease patients will have jaw tremors, not head tremors though. Parkinson's disease patients will have jaw tremors. Bradykinesia is a typical feature of Parkinson's disease. Typical feature of Parkinson's disease. Uh, whereas it's not at all a feature of essential tremors, you will never see that at any cost. So what is the treatment of choice? Here, dopaminergic drugs are the treatment of choice like L-dopa or dopamine receptor agonist. Treatment of choice here is going to be beta blockers. And essential tremor shows um, one important feature that the tremors will come down with alcohol. Tremors decrease with alcohol intake. So for that, you should not use alcohol as a treatment of essential tremors. It's better use beta blockers like propanol. That's the treatment for essential tremors. And if they ask you one imaging modality that can differentiate between Parkinson's disease and essential tremors, it is DAT scan. DAT scan. It's a dopamine transporter scan. Okay, it's a kind of a nuclear scan, kind of a PET scan, you can imagine, but not really a PET scan. So it's a DAT scan, that is dopamine transporter scan, that can differentiate between Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, where the abnormality will be seen only in Parkinson's disease. Essential tremors, it will be normal. The basal ganglia will be completely normal. So that scan is principally currently used to differentiate between Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. So tremor is worse following alcohol, is not a feature of essential tremor, in fact it improves with alcohol. Difficult initiating movement is bradykinesia, right? So this is a feature of Parkinson's disease, not essential tremors. Unilateral symptoms, this is very very important. Parkinson's disease is going to be unilateral and even if it becomes bilateral, it will be asymmetric. This is a very 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 important point. So Parkinson's disease, idiopathic Parkinson's disease always almost tends to be asymmetric. It never is supposed to be symmetric. Symmetric disease always rules out idiopathic Parkinson's disease. It cannot be symmetric. It will be asymmetric. But most of the time, essential tremors onset itself will be bilateral and it will be symmetric. So most of the time, Parkinson's disease, unilateral onset, even if it becomes bilateral, it will still remain asymmetric. Essential tremors, bilateral onset and it will be a symmetric disease. That's a very important point. So tremor is worse when the arms are outstretched. That's correct. Unilateral symptoms is wrong. Essential tremors will have bilateral symptoms. The right answer for this question is option D. So MRI, I have not, I forgot again as usual. So this is the MRI of a patient who had history of multiple falls. I the sign that is not associated with the diagnosis. Let me tell you the sign by myself. So this patient was having a hummingbird sign. Okay, I'll show the image later on. So this patient had hummingbird sign. So whenever you see hummingbird sign in MRI, I showed the MRI, uh, but anyway, so it was missing because I think I didn't paste the MRI in the PDF. Okay, fine. So hummingbird sign is seen. So what is the feature that you won't see, not associated with diagnosis? That's what you need to know. So presentation, multiple faults and hummingbird sign is suggestive of something called PSP, that is progressive supranuclear palsy, or this is called as steel Richardson syndrome. So these are atypical Parkinsonian syndromes. We're talking about atypical Parkinsonism. Atypical Parkinsonism. So there are three atypical Parkinsonian syndromes. One is MSA, that is multiple system atrophy. Second is PSP, that is progress supranuclear palsy. And third one is going to be CBD, that's corticobasal degeneration. Okay, so what about MSA? MSA patients will have bradykinesia and rigidity. Okay, Bradykin's rigidity and it will be usually symmetric disease. I told you idiopathic PD, typical Parkinson's disease will be asymmetric only. These are atypical Parkinsonism. That's why it will be symmetric disease. And uh, MSA patients can have cerebellar signs. That's called as MSAC. Cerebellar signs. If you have Parkinsonian features with cerebellar signs, that's a red flag. Because it's atypical Parkinsonism. It's MSAC. MRI sign will be hot cross burn appearance. Asked in exam, hot cross bun in MRI. Plus or minus, they can have autonomic features like bladder bowel incontinence. Okay, autonomic features, bladder bowel incontinence, orthostatic hypotension. Okay, these are all features of MSA. What about PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy? PSP is still Richardson syndrome where the patient will have postural instability. So early postural instability, that's the key word. It will be very early and they're going to present with false. Number one, false, 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 early postural instability. Then they're going to have vertical gaze palsy, typically a down gaze palsy, vertical gaze palsy, typically a down gaze palsy, typically a down gaze palsy. Okay, that's why probably you can think about uh, they can fall very often. And they can have something called as choir wave jerks. 
they are not specific findings but they are quite sensitive findings almost all cases will exhibit this square wave jux and most of the patients will have a kind of a surprise look all the time that's because of contraction paralysis of a muscle called as orbicularis supercilii so they will have always a kind of a surprise look in their eyes so cbd and it's a symmetric these patients also will have bradykinesia and rigidity and this will be symmetric as well this will be symmetric as well okay they will also have bradykinesia and rigidity what about cbd cortico basal degeneration so here is the catch this is a disease that's going to be asymmetric so among all the atypical parkinsonian feature uh, parkinsonian syndromes this is the disease that's going to be asymmetric so name itself tells isn't it cortico basal degeneration which means patient will have cortico basal degeneration which means presence of cortical symptoms and signs that's the key point here presence of cortical symptoms and signs that's the key point asymmetric cortical symptoms signs what are the important cortical symptoms and signs that you're going to look for you're going to look for apraxia a patient with parkinsonian features presenting with apraxia okay that's very important and another a is alien hand phenomenon if you see any of these two things alien hand phenomenon so two a's okay asymmetric parkinsonian features alien hand phenomenon apraxia cortical symptoms and signs that is cbd no special sign at least in psp you can see in mr you can see two important findings one is going to be the hummingbird sign due to midbrain atrophy and second is going to be your uh, mickey mouse ears okay hummingbird sign and mickey mouse ears okay these two signs can be seen in psp in cbd you won't see much you are going to see like uh, cortical atrophy predominantly in the paratotemporal regions and it will be asymmetric that asymmetry is the key again asymmetry is the key again okay asymmetric parkinsonian features apraxia alien hand cbd that's all going to answer so this is easy to know so here down gaze palsy yes that's a feature of psp slowed movements bradykinesia feature of any atypical parkinsonism square wave jacks feature of psp right answer is c for this predominant bladder and bowel disturbance because this is a feature of msa autonomic feature okay right answer for this is c so coming to wernicke's encephalopathy so in wernicke's encephalopathy uh, the earliest clinical feature to recover is ataxia ophthalmoparesis confusion memory loss we know that wernicke's encephalopathy is due to uh, thiamine deficiency basically due to thiamine deficiency thiamine deficiency so it can occur in multiple conditions typically in alcoholism okay alcoholic patients or it can occur in cancer patients malignancies so don't underestimate cancer patients and third last but not the least patients can have hyperemesis gravidarum don't underestimate these patients as well hyperemesis gravidarum that's also very important cause of wernicke's encephalopathy so what are the three features everyone knows uh, like you have a mnemonic called as coat rack what is coat rack coat confusion okay ataxia and ophthalmoplegia ophthalmoplegia okay this is typical so mnemonic is coat rack isn't it coat coat confusion of the major attacks here time in okay is going to be the treatment treatment of choice is time in i don't know for some people remember goa that is global confusion attacks of the major but i used to remember as coat confusion of the major attacks here time in is the treatment or time in deficiency is the reason for that so easy to remember first thing to recover of the major first to recover with time in treatment of the major last to recover last to recover is going to be confusion last to recover is confusion attacks a second last to recover is confusion so remember any alcoholic individual any alcoholic individual comes with altered mental status you have to consider wernicke's as one of the possibilities any alcoholic coming to emergency having confusion altered mental status think about wernicke's and that's why if they ask you whether time in or glucose it's a age old question time in or glucose which you give first you have to give time in first never give glucose first always time in first glucose next this is something that's very important for exams because if you give glucose first they can utilize rbc will utilize more time in for metabolizing glucose and there will be worsening of wernicke's encephalopathy it's always time in first then glucose okay that's a very important point so memory loss is not a feature of wernicke's encephalopathy at all in the first place even in korsakoff you don't see really memory loss rather in korsakoff you see confabulations if they mention additional confabulations 
then talk about or little bit of memory loss though you think about Korsakoff amnestic syndrome that's different okay confabulations and memory loss Korsakoff not Wernicke's and where will be the problem in Wernicke's investigation of choice if they ask you MRI that's what I'm going to do where will be the problem predominantly in the mammillary bodies okay you are going to see problems in the mammillary bodies the mammillary body necrosis and another area where you can see problem is going to be in the dorsal thalamic nucleus okay I'll repeat dorsal thalamic nucleus these are two areas where you're going to see problems okay mammillary bodies okay that's where you're going to see the problems predominantly thiamine can be given as bolus yes why not it can be given as bolus not a problem at all question number 14 okay interesting question uh, paraneoplastic syndrome characterized by anti yo antibodies is going to produce what a cerebellar degeneration b stiff person syndrome c optic neuritis and d retinopathy So what's your answer? Paraneoplastic syndromes caused by anti yo antibodies. Simple. The right answer is not B really. The right answer is A. Cerebellar degeneration. Okay. Cerebellar degeneration. So again, this is a very important area, but uh, often neglected by many students. I don't know what is the reason for that. So currently, uh, like it's, it's getting increasingly recognized uh, in many clinical situations. So what are the most important antibodies? We have something called anti-who antibodies. So one cancer that you need to know for anti-who antibodies is small cell lung cancer. Typically what's going to cause, it's going to cause something called as limbic encephalitis. Plus or minus it can cause cerebellar degeneration as well. Cerebellar degeneration. But the most important is limbic encephalitis. And how limbic encephalitis will present in exams? They're going to present with something called as psychiatric changes. That's very, very important. Psychiatric changes, they're going to present with seizures. Okay, and the onset will be very subacute in nature. It will be happening over days, two weeks. Subacute presentation, psychiatric changes, seizures. Think about limbic encephalitis. So limbic encephalitis is a syndrome. It can be caused by many other, many features. Many antibodies are there that can cause limbic encephalitis. So don't think like anti who only causes limbic encephalitis. It's a syndrome. So how the syndrome will be there? Psychiatric changes, seizures. Psychiatric changes, seizures. Plus or minus memory loss. Plus or minus memory loss because it's going to affect the medial part of the temporal lobe. That's why these behavioral problems, seizures and memory loss will be there and it will be subacute in nature. Typical limbic encephalitis. One antibody that's going to cause is anti who antibody. Okay, point number one. Second, we have something called as anti who antibody. It will be typically caused by gynecological cancers. See, there are some structures which are specific of females. What are the structures that are specific for females? You can remember yo, yo, females, yo, females, okay, specific for females. What are the structures that are specific for females? Breast and ovary and cancers. Breast and ovary, right? So those cancers are going to cause anti o antibodies and that is going to cause cerebellar degeneration. Cerebellar degeneration. Why anti o is important for exams? Because many i mean there are plenty of antibodies most of these antibodies can cause like uh, what to say many syndromes see for example anti who can cause limbic encephalitis cerebellar syndrome and some patients are there where they can get sensory problems also like neuropathy and all but anti is special because it affects only one area that is cerebellum it is exclusive for cerebellar degeneration anti o doesn't cause any other syndrome it's exclusively going to cause cerebellar syndrome. Okay, cerebellar degeneration. That's why anti is important. Cerebellar degeneration. Paraneoplasia cerebellar. Only cerebellar. No limbic encephalitis, no neuropathy, no other nonsense. Only cerebellar degeneration. That's it. How can I remember that anti antibodies? Other name is called as Purkinje cell antibody 1. Where you see Purkinje cells? Purkinje cell antibody 1. Where you see Purkinje cells? Okay, cerebellum. That's why. anti -o. Then we have something called anti re antibodies. Anti re antibodies again small cell lung cancer commonly but can be seen in breast and other gynecological cancers what they're going to cause again cerebellar degeneration plus or minus what it can cause a finding called as obsoclonus you would have studied in neuroblastoma that you're going to result in obsoclonus myoclonus syndrome this is also a kind of an antibody that can cause obsoclonus but usually it causes cerebellar degeneration okay then we have something called as anti crmp5 antibody anti crmp5 antibodies so which is which is going to be usually seen again in small cell lung cancer here old different all the time it's going to produce what limbic encephalitis again plus or minus what it's going to produce eye problems eye problems what eye problems 
it can produce optic neuritis, it can produce uveitis, eye problems, plus or minus it can also produce chorea, movement disorders, okay, chorea, movement disorders, that's anti-CRMP5. So then we have something called anti ma 2 antibodies. This, trust me, this is an exam question for sure. Remember, anti, this is already asked in exams, okay, two times they have asked in exams. So why I'm saying anti ma 2 will be asked in exams because it is due to testicular cancers, testicular cancers, testicular cancers, anti ma 2. How to remember that anti ma 2, right? Anti ma 2. So 2, 2, okay, anti ma 2, testicular cancers. Very important. Whatever way you remember, I don't care. Remember that testicular cancers, anti ma 2, what they're going to produce? Limbic encephalitis commonly, again. Okay, then we have something called as anti amp amphiphysin antibodies, anti amphiphysin antibodies, anti amphiphysin antibodies. What cancers? Again, small cell lung cancer, your same old friend. It's going to produce limbic encephalitis plus or minus one important syndrome called as stiff person syndrome, stiff person syndrome, stiff person syndrome. This is already asked twice in exams, once in JIPMA 2018 and second, they followed up in NEET exam 2020, 2019. So stiff person syndrome, anti amphiphysin antibodies. Then we have anti-recovering antibodies, anti-recovering antibodies, anti-recovering. So what is the mnemonic here? R. Why? R stands for retinopathy. Okay, R stands for retinopathy. They are going to cause recovering. Recovering means retinopathy. Recovering retinopathy. How to remember that? Two cancers, SCLC, small cell lung cancer and melanoma. Two cancers, very important. Because there are two types of retinopathy. One is called as CAR and second is called as MAR. What is CAR? CAR stands for cancer associated retinopathy that will be associated with small cell lung cancer. M, M, MAR stands for melanoma associated retinopathy. Of, of course, the name says MAR, melanoma associated retinopathy, so it's going to be associated melanoma. So two cancers, CAR, MAR, SCLC, melanoma. R for retinopathy, R for recovering antibodies. Recovering retinopathy, recovering retinopathy. That's it. And finally, you have the last but not the least antibody that can be associated with cancer that is anti-GAD antibody. Okay, anti-GAD antibody. So they can also cause limbic encephalitis. Plus or minus, they can also cause cerebellar syndrome. Plus or minus, they can also cause stiff person syndrome. Okay, stiff person syndrome. So now you can see that two antibodies can cause stiff person syndrome. One is anti-amphiphysin, second is anti-GAD antibodies. Both can cause stiff person syndrome. And interestingly, anti-GAD antibodies are also associated with type 1 diabetes, I mean LADA and type 1 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes also you will study, but that's a different fraction of antibodies, anti-GAD 65 antibody. That is associated with type 1 diabetes and LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. So anti-GAD, think about these two things. One, paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration. And what is the cancer? We didn't talk about that, isn't it? This is important because anti-GAD is associated with something called thymoma. Anti-GAD is associated with thymoma. Thymoma, anti-GAD. Okay, so these are important antibodies that's given in Harrison basically. So cerebellar degeneration, plenty of antibodies, plenty of antibodies can have cerebellar degeneration. It's not just only anti-O, but anti-O is exclusively associated with cerebellar degeneration. Okay, apart from that, anti-Who can cause, anti-Re can cause, anti-GAD can cause. I told you a while ago, anti-GAD antibodies can cause cerebellar degeneration. Stiff person, two antibodies, right? One is anti-amphiphysin antibodies, anti-amphiphysin antibodies, stiff person syndrome. And second is anti-GAD antibodies. I told you both can result in stiff person syndrome. But in exam, they will ask you anti-amphiphysin antibodies. Already twice asked. Optic neuritis, you know. Optic neuritis, what antibody? I told you CRMP5. CRMP5 antibody. That's the one that's going to cause optic neuritis. Eye problems. CRMP5. Retinopathy, we know. It is recovering antibodies. Recovering antibodies. Okay. CAR, MAR. Retinopathy. Cancerous retinopathy. Melanoma retinopathy. Two cancers. SCLC and this thing. Okay, now you can understand. So anti-antibodies, right answer for this question is going to be your option A, that is cerebellar degeneration. There are plenty of other antibodies. You know that acetylcholine receptor antibodies are associated with myasthenia gravis. 15% of the cases may have thymoma. So that's different, that everyone knows, that's why I didn't say. And you have something called anti-voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies. So let me tell two more antibodies, if you want to know. So that is anti-voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies. Usual cancer is small cell lung cancer. It's associated with something called as LEMS, that is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, or simply eaton myasthenic syndrome. And we have anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. Anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. That's associated with what? Thymoma. And we know that 15% of the cases of myasthenia gravis can be associated with thymoma. 15% cases. 
and if you really trust me go to harrison see another thing if i am the one that i'm going to ask okay if i am the one i'll ask another question because in harrison it's given you know acetylcholine receptor antibody is going to be directed against what so you have two types of see nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are of two types nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are of two types everyone knows that one is nm type second is nn type so remember thymoma if it's going to produce nm type if it's going to be nm type nm type this is present in neuromuscular junction you will result in myasthenia gravis what if the acetylcholine receptor antibodies are targeted against the nn type nicotinic type what it will result in it will result in something called as ganglionopathy ganglionopathy because nn type of receptors are present in ganglion and those type of antibodies are produced by small cell lung cancer if i am the examiner i will target this because this is also given in harrison i'm going to target this only if i am the examiner i'm not going to target myasthenia gravis i might ask this one i might give acetylcholine receptor antibody can produce ganglionopathy or not answer is absolutely yes but what type it will be direct against the nicotinic type nn type okay that's present in the ganglion that's why the same acetylcholine receptor antibody can also produce ganglionopathy okay do you understand cool that's it how much percentage of myasthenia gravis will be paraneoplastic 15% of myasthenia gravis will be paraneoplastic it's a pns it's a paraneoplastic syndrome 15% of case of myasthenia will be paraneoplastic because 15% of case of myasthenia will be associated with thymoma clear it's done and dusted so these are the antibodies okay so any of this can be asked it's an upcoming topic probably you can think it as a special topic that i have discussed okay now coming to the next question 15th question you have a patient this is an easy one you have a patient who is complaining of high grade fever and altered sensorium okay um, he was diagnosed to be suffering from meningococcal uh, meningitis which of the following is the most appropriate empirical treatment option it's an easy one it's a pyq only it's a previous year question so ceftriaxon cefetetin penicillin g cefoxidin high grade fever altered sensorium meningococcal meningitis first line treatment empirical treatment option obviously first line treatment is ceftriaxon that's it it is ceftriaxon nothing more than that so penicillin g doesn't cross the blood brain barrier at all and kefazolin kefoxidin are very poor penetration of blood brain barrier so we're going to start with ceftriaxon so if they ask about empirical therapy empirical treatment for any meningitis okay so what will be the answer you are going to start with ceftriaxone plus you are going to start with vancomycin plus or minus dexamethasone which is an optional but many times we start dexamethasone plus or minus i am going to start with acyclovir acyclovir okay if you suspect herpes simplex encephalitis so these are the options for empirical therapy ceftriaxone vanco usual dexamethasone most cases yes if you suspect herpes simplex encephalitis then you can start with acyclovir as well this is the usual empirical therapy for suspected meningitis in adults okay generally the first drug that we are going to use is ceftriaxone and don't forget the table many times in neat exam they are going to ask that simple table how to differentiate between your uh, bacterial meningitis viral meningitis that is aseptic meningitis and fungal meningitis what are the different features so let me give you a kind of an algorithm so let us assume you are suspecting meningitis okay meningitis or meningoencephalitis whatever you are suspecting how will you suspect patient is present with fever headache neck stiffness altered mental status plus or minus altered mental status if this is the key feature in exam you are going to suspect meningitis or meningoencephalitis what are you going to do next either you are going to do lp or you are going to do ct scan this depends on so many features so you are going to see something called as fails that is the next step so what do you mean by fails? F stands for focological deficit. Okay. A stands for altered mental status. I stands for immunosuppressed individual. L stands for any known space occupying lesion. Lesion. Lesion is for L stands for. Yes means patient presenting with seizure. Okay. So known case of space occupying lesion. So you have to look at fails. If any of the fails is there, then you have to do CT first. If the fails is not there, okay, if all these are not there, no to all, if none of this is there, then you have to do lumbar puncture straight away, LP first. 
So anyway, if CT is clear, if CT is clear, then you are going to do LP next. CT is clear, you can do LP next. Lumbar puncture next. So I, I can write like this. It's better to create an algorithm like this. So no means straight away you can go for LP. You not do CT. If fails is there, first CT, then LP. If fails is not there, straight away you can go for LP, no problem. So LP next. So in the LP, what is the most important thing that you need to look for? Everyone knows the table, so I'm not going to talk about the table. Even I have talked about the table in one of the PYQ sessions, the first session I did in Cerebellum. I talked about that table, right? So LP next. In the LP, what are you going to see? The most important is the cell count. That's the most important. And you need to see what cells you're predominantly seeing, whether it's neutrophils or lymphocytes. That's the next important thing, neutrophils or lymphocytes. If you're predominantly seeing the neutrophils, it is simple. It's ABM, acute bacterial meningitis. And now you have to wait for the gram strain and the culture reports. If it's predominantly lymphocytes, what is the next step? Look at the glucose. Look at glucose. Okay. So if the glucose is normal, it's different. If the glucose is low, it's different. In exams, if the glucose is normal, think about viral cause or aseptic meningitis, but we have plenty of other alternative conditions versus there could be a lot of other problems that can present with this picture. Okay. You can think about autoimmune encephalitis. You can even think about paraneoplastic encephalitis. Okay. You can think about autoimmune encephalitis and you can think about paraneoplastic encephalitis as well. But let us see in a common sense. Okay. It's viral, predominantly viral. Okay. It's predominantly viral. Usual situation, you're going to diagnose a viral encephalitis or aseptic meningitis. If the glucose is low, you're going to talk about fungal or you're going to talk about tuberculosis. So what will be the clues for fungal? Patient will be a HIV patient with very low CD4 count. Number one. And what's the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice is going to be serum and CSF crack. That is cryptococcal antigen. That's what I'm going to do. And treatment of choice is going to be amphotericin B plus or minus flu cytosin. Okay, but amphotericin B is the gold standard treatment plus or minus flu cytosin. That's the treatment of choice. But most of the time, the clue will be HIV patient with such a low CD4 count. Investigation of choice is crack. That is cryptocal antigen. And treatment of choice is going to be amphotericin B plus or minus flu cytosin. What about tuberculosis? Tuberculosis, and you know the clues will be the cobweb nature of the CSF. Or probably other clues will be patients can have history of tuberculosis or they can give uh, evidence of cavity in a, in lung, cavity in lung. Okay, these are all some other clues that the examiner might give evidence of cavity in the lung or history of tuberculosis in the past. Okay, and ADA will be elevated, CSF ADA will be elevated. Okay, CSF ADA will be elevated. Apart from that, what else? You can also um, have, yeah, gene expert can be done. Gene expert, sorry, I think I should not write gene expert, right? What is that? It's CBNAT. Okay, CBNAT. That is cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test. That can be done. That can be done. Okay, that can be positive. And what will be the clue in imaging? In CT and MRI, you will characteristically see something called as basal exudates and hydrocephalus. Basal exudates and hydrocephalus. So these are the clues for TB in exam. Cobweb, history of TB, evidence of cavity in the lung, AD elevated, CB not positive, that is gene expert positive. CTMRI will show the typical basal exudates or basal and basal uh, like areas will be enhanced in and contrast and you are going to have hydrocephalus. Sometimes you need VP shunt also. So this is how you approach, isn't it? So this is an easy way to approach uh, any patient with suspected meningitis or meningitis. Easy to know. So we know that this is a simple question, but I just want to say like a right kind of an approach that you do generally in your meningitis approach. So I think I've covered this one. So now let us move on to hematology section. So I have some questions for you. So easy one. Let us just uh, quickly flush away the hematology part because uh, we have some important questions. I think most of it will be discussed in other areas as well. So let me just quickly go through. You have a 66 year old woman who comes to the emergency I'm, i have to finish another half an hour 40 minutes man i cannot take more time than that 
okay now i cannot do but later on i'll definitely do limo no problem at all so okay so a 66 year old woman comes to the emergency room with complaints of fatigue two days ago and episode of hemoptysis she has history of af and osteoarthritis on naproxen and warfarin bp is 60 40 now so labs showed inr 5.1 uh, hemocrites 12.6 she received IV vitamin K and four units of PRBs and four units of FFP eight days eight hours later she begins to complain shortness of breath vitals temperature 39 degrees Celsius which means she is febrile uh, respiratory rate is 35 tachypneic saturation is 84 hypoxemic and then uh, BP has become like uh, 100 by 52 after stabilization there is evidence of bilateral crackles and the patient was intubated for respiratory failure chest x-ray shown below so what is the likely diagnosis? Easy one. So many times they tend to ask these kind of questions, isn't it? So transfusion reactions are very important. That's why I kept this question as the number one question. So it in, it doesn't tell you that they will ask only trally, but beware of all the transfusion reactions. One thing they will commonly ask in exam is transfusion reactions. In that they will ask you the differences between trally and taco. So this is a case of trally. Very very simple. So how will you differentiate between trally and taco? Okay, so there are some clues. There are many things to know, but let me tell you only the certain important clues. So trally patients, common, commonly they receive plasma products. Plasma products common. Usually here the problem will be PRBCs. But remember it's not always to not always. They can get with anything, but commonly trally will be due to plasma products because they contain more antibodies. Okay, that's the problem. And PRBCs is the one that's going to be the usual reason for taco but not always not always that's very very important so what about trally trally patients will be having temperature so that's not seen in taco trally patients taco patients will be having high jvp and other signs of volume overload signs of volume overload volume overload okay that will not be seen in case of trally and patients will have normal or high bp no hemodynamic instability in fact normal bp or high bp in patients with taco whereas trally patients will be usually having hypotension low bp these are the three important points that you need to know for exams hemodynamic instability okay hemodynamic instability patients who are uh, having a normal jvp patients who are having fever okay these are the three important clues for transfusion related acute lung injury it's like an ARDS only many times the chest x-ray will show bilateral infiltrates and uh, you will have an ARDS kind of a picture and for both these things treatment is supportive only so what are the common features between trally and taco patients are going to have um, shortness of breath patient will have crackles or crepitations in the lungs bilaterally patients will have bilateral infiltrates in the chest x-ray Patient saturation will be low, patient's PO2 will be low, hypoxemic. So these are common features between both trally and taco. So our patient okay, is having increased temperature, patient is hypotensive and is going to usually occur around one to six, two to six hours after like transfusion of especially a plasma product. It can occur with PRBCs also, but plasma products are more dangerous with regards to trally. So that this is basically a trally. Anaphylaxis will be presenting in a different way. They will have like bronchospasm, wheezing, uh, laryngeal edema, strider, arctic area, rash. That's a different presentation. That's not anaphylaxis. Yeah. Now coming to question number two. Challenging question. So definitely if you have studied pathology, well, this must be an easy one. So 19 year old present with com uh, complaints of tender painful skin lesions in axilla. He reports multiple similar episodes in the past. Current report positive cultures for seresia. Marsessens, all of the following statements are true except very challenging question. So this is what you are seeing over here in this patient. So this is nothing but a folliculitis, axillary folliculitis that's what I'm seeing and they have told it's positive for Seresia Marsessens. So number one, I'm telling which is false. I'm asking which is false. Option A states infection with coagulase positive organism are typical. Prophylactic use of cotrimoxole is effective. Diagnosed by DHR123 test that is dihydrorhodamine123 test. Transmitted by x link recessive inheritance. So what is the right answer for this?
I'm getting many right answers basically. The right answer for this question is option A. Okay, infection with coagulase positive organisms are typical because the diagnosis here is basically chronic granulomatous disease, CGD. Okay, chronic granulomatous disease where the patients are going to have infect. I mean, um, infection with catalase positive organisms. We are going to have infection with catalase positive organisms, not coagulase positive organisms. Catalase positive organisms. Okay, so that is CGD, chronic granulomatous disease. So prophylactic use of TMPSMX in patients with chronic granulomatous is definitely helpful. There's no doubt about that. And what is the defect? Who's going to tell the defect in chronic granulomatous disease? Who's going to tell the defect? So where is the defect? What is the problem here in chronic granulomatous disease? Okay, fine. So what are the catalyst portion? What are the mnemonic for that? So some people used to remember space positive organisms, some people called as case. Okay, so what is case? Candida. Okay, A stands for aspergillus, two fungus, catalase positive. Yes, the deficiency is going to be in NADPH oxidase. S stands for Staphylococcus aureus and the second is Serratia marcescens. Staphylococcus and Serratia marcescens. Okay, so these things and second is Enterobacteria, including Pseudomonas. Enterobacteriaceae, especially pseudomonas. You should not forget that. These are basically catalyst positive organisms. The mnemonic for that is case. Candida, aspergillus, staph, serratia marcescens, enterobacteriaceae. Here the patient is having recurrent infections with serratia marcescens, which is basically a catalyst positive organism, not a coagulase positive organism. So that's why this is a wrong statement. And CGD is going to have excellent recessive inheritance. In fact, 70% plus cases are going to have X-link recessive inheritance only. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Everyone knows. And the defect is going to be in NNDPH oxidase. You know that they cannot produce the reactive oxygen species. Okay, they will produce the phagolysosome fusion. That will occur. But inside the phagolysosome, they will not be able to kill the microorganisms because they cannot produce the reactive oxygen species. Okay, that's a killing defect. Basically, not a phagocytosis defect. That's different. You have studied in pathology. Here, the phagocytosis will occur, but they cannot kill the organism. That's the problem. So killing defect, not phagocytosis defect. 70% cases plus excellent recessive inheritance. And yes, because these patients are at risk of infections again and again and again. Okay, you have to definitely use some prophylactic antibiotics, which is very important in this case. That is cotrimoxazole. It's very effective. And sometimes you can give itraconazole also because these patients are at risk of fungal infections as well. So itraconazole also should be considered in patients with recurrent fungal infections. And diagnosis, two tests are there. One is called as NB2, that's called as nitro blue tetrazoleum chloride. I mean, uh, nitro, blue, nitro blue tetrazoleum test, that's called NBD test. That's not very helpful, but rather the current test of choice is going to be dihydrorhodamine 1, 2, 3 test. Or this is called as DHR123. It's a flow cytometry based test. DHR123 test is flow cytometry based test. The advantage of DHR123 test is the fact that it can detect carriers also. Carriers can also be detected with DHR123. It's a flow cytometry based test. Carriers also can be detected. That's why this is going to be the current investigation of choice. But traditionally, what you all know is NBT test. That's what is used. The right answer for this question is option A. Okay, going to the next one. So it's easy, I cannot uh, discuss the entire thing because I'm running out of time. Let me quickly go through. So like what is the expected MCV in CBC of this patient's peripheral smear image. CBC of this peripheral smear. So I can show the peripheral smear. I think now you can see it. So what you're seeing here are basically microcytic and hypochromic RBC. Why it's microcytic? So generally what we do in peripheral smear, we're going to compare the RBC size with that of a small lymphocyte. If it's almost equal, it's normocytic. If it's less than that, it's microcytic. If it's more than that, it is macrocytic. Okay, more than that, if it's going to be macrocytic. Here you can see there are plenty of RBCs that are smaller compared to the small lymphocyte nearby. So it is a microcytic RBC. And you can see that the central pillar is not just one third. The central pillar is more than one third of the RBC size. 
So that is definitely my microcytic hypochromic RBC. And you can see anisopyclocytosis. You can see a lot of like kind of teardrop like cells. And there is multiple variations in the shape and size of RBC. This is nothing but anisopyclocytosis. All these things are going to go towards a microcytic. That is MCV of less than 80. So easy one. Isn't it? Microcytic hypochromic. So in exam, how will you approach a patient with anemia? So we know that somebody comes with anemia. There are plenty of ways to approach anemia. Let us talk from an undergrad perspective. We not talk from a postgrad perspective. So in postgrad perspective, I can tell you so many things. But how will you discuss from a... One second. I'm not able to do something. Sorry. Correct. Okay. So how will you discuss from an undergrad perspective? The first thing that you need to know is see the MCV. So whenever the patient is having anemia. So MCV less than 80, you're going to call it as microcytic anemia. MCV 80 to 100, normocytic. MCV more than 100, macrocytic. Let me tell you only a key feature. What is important for exams? Macrocytic. Macrocytic anemia. If it's microcytic anemia, you're going to have only four causes. What are the four causes? Think about iron deficiency anemia. Think about anemia of chronic disease. Think about uh, thalassemia. Okay, think about thalassemia. And fourth, you're going to think about sideroblastic anemia. Okay, sideroblastic anemia. So how will you differentiate each and everything? Iron deficiency anemia, number one, ferritin will be low. Okay, that's going to tell you that key. Ferritin will be low. Ferritin will be decreased in iron deficiency anemia. Nothing more is required. Anemia of chronic disease, Ferritin may be normal or increased. Usually ferritin will be increased. But what's going to tell the difference between anemia of chronic disease versus iron deficiency anemia is the transferrin saturation. Transferrin saturation. What is transferrin saturation? Iron by TABC ratio. Iron by TABC in iron deficiency anemia will be less than 18% for sure. That's very, very important. And in the setting of uh, anemia of chronic disease, the transferrin saturation will be more than 18%. That's the clue. Which means iron by TABC will be more than 18 percentage transfer and saturation will be more than 18 percentage so why because in uh, iron deficiency anemia iron will be low tabc will be high iron will be low tabc will be high that's why the ratio is very very low numerator is decreasing denominator is increasing ratio very low whereas in cases of anemia of chronic disease both are basically decreasing iron is also decreasing tabc is also decreasing that's the reason why the ratio is maintained to a value of more than 18 percent this is a very very important number to look for in exams and uh, what is the reason for anemia of chronic disease? It is due to increased hepcidin. Reason is increased hepcidin that blocks the iron absorption from the gut as well as iron release from the reticular endothelial system. So because hepcidin is going to block something called as ferropotent. It's a ferropotent inhibitor. Even that is an exam question. So what about thalassemia? So remember, I'm not going to talk about all the different types of thalassemia, major, minor, intermediate, but uh, what about minor? So in that we are talking about beta thalassemia minor. So that's what will be asked in exam because it's the closest differential diagnosis for iron deficiency anemia. So what are the clues? So one thing will be like uh, patient will have normal iron indices, which means ferritin will be normal. All the iron indices will be normal. Normal ferritin, normal iron, normal TABC, normal transmissation, everything will be normal. Okay, in beta thalassemia minor, rather the patient will have increased RBC count. Okay, the patient will have increased RBC count, not decreased RBC count. Iron deficiency anemia patients will have reduced RBC count. Even in anemia of chronic disease, you are going to have reduced RBC count. Okay, but thalassemia patients, uh, trait patients will have increased RBC count. That is the basis of your Menzer index. That's the basis of your Menzer index. So what is Menzer index? So this is nothing but uh, your MCV by RBC count. So because MCV is going to be very, very low in thalassemia, RBC count is going to be uh, increased in patients with thalassemia minor the count will be mensur index will be less than 13 that's very important because numerator is decreasing denominator is increasing the uh, ratio will be less than 13 but if it's iron deficiency anemia the mensur index is going to be more than 13 because here the mc will be low but rbc count also will be low that's the reason why mensur index will be more than 13 okay what about sideroblastic anemia it's iron overload increased ferritin and increased transferrin saturation so both will be there. It's due to iron overload. So increase in ferritin and increase in transferrin saturation as well. So don't forget, 
pyridoxin deficiency. Most of the time they will target INH and pyridoxin deficiency. INH and pyridoxin deficiency. This is what they are going to target. Don't think about congenital causes predominantly. Most of the times the simple clue will be pyridoxin deficiency and isony acidus. That can also result in a kind of cytoblastic anemia. But the bone marrow will be the ultimate clue in cytoblastic anemia where we are going to see ring decidroblasts. And ring decidroblasts will be seen in bone marrow only. You will not see the ring decidroblasts in uh, peripheral smear. Even that is an exam question. Yeah. Lead poisoning. Yes, of course, there are plenty of reasons for cytoplastic anemia, but in exam, usually students tend to miss out on the pyridoxin deficiency and the isony acidus. Or even alcoholics can develop cytoplastic anemia, but not so common. They tend to develop macrocytic anemias very commonly. So what about normocytic anemia? Normocytic means usually it could be an aplastic anemia or it could be a hemolytic anemia. So in this situation, look at the reticulocyte count first. That's the most important point. Look at the retic count. Whether retic count and retic index is low or retic count retic index is high, uh, if retic count and retic index is high, next step is to look at the LDH. If the LDH is increased, it's very likely to be a hemolytic anemia. You are dealing with a hemolytic anemia. If the LDH, LDH is normal, if the LDH is not increased, you are talking about a recent blood loss. Okay, recent blood loss due to some trauma. Not very acute blood loss. Hyperacute blood loss will not have any much response. But if it's a recent, recent, relatively recent blood loss, then your reticul uh, LDH will be normal, but retic count will be higher because bone marrow uh, will start responding by producing more RBCs. The retic count is low and the patient is having a normocytic anemia. Retic count is low and the patient is having normocytic anemia. What are you going to think about? Predominantly, you are going to think about, yes, either sometimes anemia of chronic disease or you are going to think about a plastic anemia. A plastic anemia. This will be the clue. These are the two things that can be there. See, anemia of chronic disease can sometimes have a normocytic picture also. So what will be the clue in aplastic anemia? Aplastic anemia, the clue will be pancytopenia. In anemia of chronic disease, you are not going to have pancytopenia though. You will not have pancytopenia. Here, you are going to have pancytopenia. Plus, the bone marrow aspiration will show only more of fat with less cellularity. More fat with less cellularity. That's the key more fat with less cellularity. So that's what we're going to see in bone marrow. That's what for normocytic anemia. If it's macrocytic, then look for megaloblastic changes. Megaloblastic changes. If yes, if yes, are going to think about B12 and folate deficiency, there are plenty of other causes also. If not, think about other conditions. The most common cause for non-megaloblastic macrocytosis is alcohol. Alcohol is the most common cause of non-megaloblastic macrocytosis and it can occur in liver disease okay or it can occur with aplastic anemia okay aplastic anemia and so on so liver disease alcohol aplastic anemia there are plenty of reasons that can produce non-megaloblastic macrocytosis even aplastic anemia can produce what both normocytic as well as macrocytic picture you need to be clear about that but the most common cause is alcohol so in that they will be asking you B12 and folate deficiency how to uh, differentiate. So in real time B12 and folate deficiency, how to differentiate both will have hypersegmented neutrophils, both can have so many problems, but how to differentiate between B12 and folate deficiency. So B12 deficiency is typically is going to have, um, um, both will have anemia, but the key is neurological manifestations. Neurological features which will be a feature of B12 deficiency, but you don't get neurological problems in folate deficiency and second is skin hyperpigmentation okay knuckle hyperpigmentation is a feature of b12 and you don't get that in folate deficiency this is a typical knuckle hyperpigmentation that you tend to get in b12 deficiency and what are the neurological manifestations the plenty of neurological manifestations that can occur even that could be asked in exam number one is sacd that is subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord second patients can develop dementia even due to excess methyl malonic acid and third, patients can develop peripheral neuropathy. And this peripheral neuropathy will be axonal type peripheral neuropathy, not demyelinating. But interestingly, SACD is due to demyelination. Interestingly, SACD is due to demyelination. SACD is due to demyelination, but the peripheral neuropathy is not demyelinating. Basically, it is axonal. So that's another important difference that you need to know. And then both will have elevated homocysteine, but the methyl malonic acid levels are going to be the key. It will be elevated only in B12 deficiency. It will be normal in folate deficiency. You know, right, a patient who is having B12 deficiency, if you give folate only, the hematological parameters will improve, but the neurological dysfunction will worsen. You know that that's 
different uh, you have something called folate trap isn't it so that's the reason why if you give folate in a patient with b12 deficiency the neurological manifestations will worsen but anemia may improve okay so these are the important differences so now we have discussed on this slide as well now let us it's time for some oncology okay so all are true regarding carcinoma of unknown primary except so tumor markers are non-specific most are squamous cell cancers most common genetic alteration is KRAS mutation and CK7, CK negative is the typical profile of colorectal cancers. So which of the following is correct? It's your take now. You're going to answer. Okay, the right answer, I mean, nobody is answering this. Maybe I can answer. The right answer for this question is option D, that is CK7, CK20 is not a typical profile of colorectal cancers. Instead, colorectal cancers will be CK7, CK7 negative and CK20 positive. Okay, so that's a typical profile of colorectal cancers. So tumor markers are non-specific. That's absolutely correct. So most of tumor markers are not going to localize. They're non-specific. They can be elevated in many. Uh, CUP stands for carcinoma of unknown primary, cancer of unknown primary, cancer of unknown primary. So tumor markers are non-specific. That's perfectly correct. Tumor markers are never specific for any cancer. So they can be elevated in many non-tumorous conditions also. Like for example, beta hCG can be elevated in pregnancy. PSA can be elevated in benign prostatic hypertrophy as well as in prostatitis. So most of the cancers and related tumor markers are non-specific. They cannot locate a cancer. Most are squamous cell cancers wrong because uh, around 60% plus, more than 60% of the cancers are going to be adenocarcinomas. Okay, they are not squamous cell cancers, they are adenocarcinomas. Most of the cancer of unknown primaries will be adenocarcinomas, which means what is un cancer of unknown primary? You are seeing metastatic lesions, but you don't know where the primary is originating from. What is the primary cancer? You don't have an idea. Most common genomic alteration is not KRAS mutation, it's actually P53. That's given in Harrison. Every single statement I've told you is from Harrison. Okay, P53, it's not KRAS. KRAS can occur, but it's maybe second or third most common, but the most common genomic aberration in a patient with cancer of unknown primary is P53 mutation. And CK7, CK20 negative is a typical profile. This is also wrong, right? CK7, I mean, the most common gene mutation overall in any cancer is KRAS. I mean, RAS mutation, you would have studied that. If they talk about pancreatic adenocarcinoma in particular, KRAS mutation, that's fine, that's answer. But in cancer of unknown primary, it's P53, okay? That was given in Harrison. So CK7 negative, CK20 negative is like typical profile of something else, not like your uh, colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer will be CK7 negative, CK20 positive. This is something that's been asked so many times. I can remember like they've asked three times. Two times in NEET and once in INACT exam. If you have doubt, you go to the INACT 2020 exam and 2020 or 2021 maybe. I think November 2020 to be precise. Look at this question, it will be there. And in NEET exam 2016 and 2017, look at this question, it will be there. CK719, CK20 positive. That is... Okay, all are incorrect regarding. Okay, so sorry for that. Tumor markers. Option A is correct only. So I think uh, I framed the question in a wrong manner. So, so the let us assume like tumor markers are specific. Okay, so that is the option. So that is wrong. Okay, tumor markers are specific. So that is an incorrect statement. Okay. Okay, I, I missed it on the option. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, man. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I think I am like a little sleepy. I missed it on the options. The explanations, whatever I gave you, are absolutely correct. Sorry for that. So option A is correct. Tumor markers are non-specific. We are asking about all of the following are incorrect except, right? So this is incorrect. Most are adenocarcinomas. Okay, adenocarcinomas. Most common is not KRAS. It's P53. Sorry for that. And uh, CK7, CK20 negative is not the typical profile of CRCs. Rather, CK7 negative, CK20 positive. That will be the typical profile of CRCs. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so I think option, the right answer for this question is option A. Because tumor markers are non-specific is correct. They're not specific for any cancer. The remaining three statements are basically wrong. Okay, so sorry for that. So let me tell you the profiles first. 
So then coming to CK7, okay, cytokeratin 7, these are nothing but intermediate filaments, even that is an exam question, you know that, right, CK, CK, cytokeratins are basically intermediate filaments. So CK7, first see whether it's positive or whether it is negative. How to remember CK7 positivity and CK7 negativity? So tell me some cancers that are very special for females, that occurs only in females. What cancers? Tell cancers that are going to occur only in females. What are the cancers that will occur only in females? So what organs are specific for females? Ovary and breast, right? So we're going to have ovarian cancers and they're going to have breast cancers. First of all, yeah, ovary and breast. Two things. One, thyroid is there only in females, huh? I think people are sleeping more than me, man. See, cervix cancer is a squamous cell cancer, right? But most of the CUPs will be adenocarcinomas. We know that. So don't tell cervical cancer. Talk about adenocarcinomas. Ovary and breast. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. So ovary and breast will be CK7 positive. Female only tumors. So I can say two things. One, tumors above the diaphragm. Okay, tumors above the diaphragm. And female only tumors. So what are the female only tumors that you encounter? So female only tumors are going to be the ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and why not endometrial cancer? Endometrium, right? It's ovary, breast, and endometrium. Okay, so these are female only cancers. So they are going to be CK7 positive. And above the diaphragm, what are the most important adenocarcinomas above the diaphragm? Adenocarcinomas above the diaphragm. Adenocarcinomas. Thyroid. Okay, don't say breast again. Thyroid and you have something called non-small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer is not an adenocarcinoma. You're talking about non-small cell lung cancer. So these are the cancers. Above the diaphragm, female only. Above the diaphragm and you can say even mesothelioma. Mesothelioma, right? Mesothelioma. Female only, above the diaphragm. These are the two clues. Above the diaphragm, thyroid, breast, lung cancer, non-small cell though because adenocarcinoma comes under non-small cell lung cancer and mesothelioma. Okay, these are going to be above the diaphragm. And that how to differentiate, okay, between each and everything. So most of these cancers, okay, will be CK20 positive as well. They will be CK20 positive. Sorry, 20 negative. Most of this cancer will be CK20 negative as well. So CK7 positive, the clue will be, see esophageal cancers, yeah, lower, but forget that. So most of the time, Above the diaphragm cancers, female only cancers. CK7 positive, CK20 negative. But what cancers can be CK7 positive and CK7, CK20 positive? So some below the diaphragm, some below the diaphragm tumors, which is close to the diaphragm. Biliary tract cancers, biliary tract cancers, pancreatic cancers, pancreatic cancers, okay, biliary pancreas, biliary pancreatic cancers and bladder cancers, bladder cancers. So how to remember this? I will tell you some clues how to remember this because this is confusing, right? Below the diaphragm, some below the diaphragm tumors also. These are tumors that are below the diaphragm, but still they are CK7 positive. But these cancers will be CK20 positive as well. How to remember that? How to remember? How many letters you have in biliary? How many letters you have in biliary? B I L I A R Y. Seven letters. How many letters you have in bladder? B L A D D E R. Seven letters. Seven positive. And pancreas has seven in it. So seven positive. Pancreas. Okay. Has seven in it. So it will be seven positive. That's how you can remember. Because these tumors are going to occur below the diaphragm. Okay. They are atypical. So they will be 20 positive also, atypical. So they will be 20 positive as well. So anything above the diaphragm, female only tumors, 20 negative. Okay, female only, above the diaphragm, 20 negative. Okay, if it's going to be below the diaphragm, atypical tumors like this, 20 positive. So as simple as that. So if it's CK7 negative, 
So only two things that you need know, know whether it's a colorectal cancer or not a colorectal cancer and others because colorectal cancer is something that's very commonly asked in exam. I told you colorectal cancer 20 positive. How to remember that colorectal cancer is 20 positive? So you have more letters in colorectal, right? C O L O R E C T A L. So many letters are there. So in fact, if you count the number of letters in colorectal cancer, so C O L O R E C T A L. Ten letters are there, and how many words are there in colorectal? Colo rectal. Two letters. Okay, two words. So twenty. Ten into two is twenty. So colorectal cancers. Okay, colorectal. Total number of letters, 10, 2 words, multiply by 2, 20. So they will be CK20 positive, colorectal cancer. Okay, then what about others? Other cancer, anything else apart from that? So, like for example, HCC, RCC, renal cell cancer. Then uh, above the kidneys, what is there? Adrenal cancer, adrenal cancers. And uh, neuroendocrine tumors. What are the neuroendocrine tumors? Your small cell lung cancer, neuroblastomas, okay, then germ cell tumors, everything else, then squamous cell cancers, all are double negative, they will be CK7 negative and CK20 negative as well, double negative, whenever it's double negative, think about other cancers like HCC, RCC, above the kidney, adrenal gland, the neuroendocrine tumors like small cell lung cancer, okay, non-adenocarcinomas like squamous cell cancer, these are all basically non-adenocarcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors, germ cell tumors, squamous cell cancers, all are non-adenocarcinoma tumors, they will be double negative, CK20 negative, easy to remember, so most of the time, they will be asking you only, see I told, I mean, this is a really tough area, I understand, but uh, I don't know how to explain that, so that's why I told you a lot of uh, uh, mnemonics, in the sense like, I don't know, Okay, so how to explain that, but maybe like the, this mnemonic may be helpful, maybe you can build up more and more mnemonics with regards to that. So now you can understand, okay, fine, so we have done that, so now let us move on to the next question. So let us finish off quicker as soon as possible. Which of the following is the characteristic feature of tumor suppressor gene? So I'm going to talk about some of the oncological questions also. So characteristic of tumor suppressor gene. The mutant allele is often inherited through germline. The somatic mutation does not contribute to cancer. The inherited form of the mutant allele does not commonly have a tissue preference and uh, the mutant allele acts in a dominant fashion. Mutant allele acts in a dominant fashion, okay. Inherited through germline, somatic mutation does not contribute to tumor. Inherited form of the mutant allele does not commonly have a tissue preference and mutant allele acts in a dominant fashion. So which are the following is a characteristic feature of a tumor suppressor gene. The right answer for this question is simple. They are asking which of the following is true characteristic of a tumor suppressor gene. Answer is A. The mutant allele is going to often be inherited through the germline. That's correct. Somatic mutation does not contribute to cancer. Wrong. Somatic mutation also contributes to cancer. Inherited form of mutant allele does not have tissue preference. Wrong. Usually tumor suppressor genes and related cancers tend to have strong tissue preference and mutant allele uh, acts in a dominant fashion is also wrong. It's basically recessive. So first you need to know what are the differences between tumor suppressor genes and protoncogenes. Okay, that's the difference. Tumor suppressor genes and protoncogenes. Tumor suppressor genes are going to be recessive, number one. Okay, recessive in the sense you need uh, both mutations. Okay, uh, both the genes should be mutated, both the alleles should be mutated. So we have two alleles, right? Allele number one and allele number two. Allele number one and allele number two. So allele one Generally, the usual thing is both, it should have both hits, two hits. That's the basis of nuts and stewie hypothesis. One will be usually germline. They will strongly have germline mutation. Second can be either germline or somatic. Germline or somatic, but it's rare to have a germline. Usually it will be somatic, acquired mutation over a period of time. Second will be acquired. Okay, somatic and it will be acquired. Or rarely it could be germline. Both can be germline mutations. I'm not disagreeing with that fact, but generally this is the order first germline already the mutation will be there by birth itself second will be acquired through due to some environmental alterations that somatic and this is the basis of nuts and two hit hypothesis with regards to uh, cancers due to mutations of tumor suppressor genes so nuts and two hit hypothesis doesn't apply only to retinoblastoma gene it applies to any tumor suppressor gene for that matter including p53 or any other tumor suppressor gene that you know protoncogenes on the other hand is dominant which means just a single gene mutation is enough and most of them will be acquired most of them will be somatic and most of them will be acquired. They will not be inherited. That's an important point. 
most of them will be somatic and acquired only very few exceptions are there one of the characteristic exception is the mentu syndrome red protoncogen mutation that is germline inherited autosomal dominant otherwise very rare to have a like uh, inherited protoncogen mutation most of the protoncogen mutations will be acquired somatic only germline rare best example is going to be this thing uh subhashni subhi is telling that most of the questions are beyond need necessity sorry if i'm wrong no actually many questions i framed based on pyqs only and i've just taken the tough pyqs that's all because if i keep easy pyqs for example if i'm going to ask a question on uh, which of the following you don't see in tumor lysis syndrome if i say like hypouricemia as an option what is the fun in knowing that question in the first place that's the that's the idea of entire thing so most of the questions whatever i have discussed are basically uh, to be honest pyqs only majority of them are pyqs but i've taken only the tough pyqs and the tough topics i have not taken the easier forms so it's very easy for me to go and tell like very easy questions uh, say maybe i can ask like, which of the following is the tumor suppressor gene in that i will give an obvious option of retinoblastoma gene or p53 gene so if i'm going to set that kind of a question so what is the big deal in revision so why you want to revise in the first place those kind of things so everyone knows isn't it the idea is not to make you well versed in such easy questions with closed eyes where you can answer the idea of these sessions is to make you well versed in like certain areas which are tough and which are basically like kind of like cranky in exams that is the entire idea of these sessions okay not just like uh, giving like questions that are easy in it i agree that in neat exam like maybe 100 out of 200 questions will be straight forward in the sense even if you are not going to like study anything just with final knowledge you can answer 80 questions 80 to 90 questions okay even even i'm telling you don't read anything just go to the exam 85 to 90 questions easily you can answer because they'll be so easy so the fun is not in answering those questions the fun is answering that 100 to 140 questions that's the second step the third step is going to 160 to one i mean 140 to 160 questions the fourth step final step is 160 plus so that's why you go step by step okay that's the that's the problem so i mean she's not wrong but i just thought like uh, these sessions should be not just high yielding these sessions should be useful I'm going to discuss only questions that are uh, like very easy. It's not high yielding. Easy questions are not high yielding. Trust me. Okay, correct. So now coming to this thing. So proto-oncogenes are going to have most of them are somatic, acquired mutations. Exceptions are very rare. We have red mutations which are inherited, but most of them will be uh, dominant only, like acquired mutations only. And another interesting thing is that tumor suppressor gene related cancers will have strong tissue preference strong tissue preference so the best example for that will be retinoblastoma gene so what is the tumor that you get because of retinoblastoma gene retinoblastoma so they are going to have a strong tissue preference but tumors due to pro protoncogen mutations will not have any tissue preference they are not going to have any tissue preference at all okay that's what is mentioned here the mutant allele is often inherited that's perfectly correct so many times it will be inherited. That doesn't mean the somatic mutation does not contribute to cancer. So I told you germline is usually the case. Somatic should also be there to produce a cancer. Only germline is not enough. Somatic is required. That's why that statement is wrong. Inherited form does not have a tissue preference wrong. I told you most of the tumor suppressor gene related cancers will have a strong tissue preference. And mutant will acts in a dominant fashion wrong because it acts in a recessive fashion. Okay. So now we know everything about protoncogenes and uh, tumor suppressor genes. So now sixth question, easy one, which of the following is not a hallmark of cancer? Immune evasion and avoiding immune destruction, escaping growth inhibitory signals, energy from oxidative phosphorylation, tumor promoting inflammation. So which of the following is like I'm asking, which is not a hallmark, which means which is wrong. Option A. Option A, immune evasion and avoiding immune-mediated destruction. That's correct. Okay. One of the important hallmarks of cancer is immune evasion and they avoid immune-mediated destruction. So the best example is your immune checkpoints, checkpoint control, the PD-1, PDL one checkpoint. Okay. That's why you have developed some monoclonal antibodies. 
against them and CTLA-4 checkpoint is there. So these are the best examples of immune evasion, how they can control these checkpoints and evade immunity. Okay, PD-1, what is the monoclonal antibody against PD-1? The best example is Pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab. What is the monoclonal antibody against PD-L1? We have Atizolizumab. We have Durvalumab. Atizolizumab. Durvalumab. Avelumab. So many drugs are there. So here we have another drug called as Nivolumab also. So what is the anti-CTLA-4 molecule? Okay, that can be used in tumors. Ipilimumab. Ipilimumab. And we have a newer drug that's been released just maybe one month ago that's called as Trimilimumab. Trimilimumab. Okay, this is a newer one. Ipilimumab and Trimilimumab. Okay, this is CTLA-4. So, so we can use that point. Escaping growth inhibitory signals? Yes. Okay, they in they escape the apoptotic signals, for example. They overproduce like probably anti-apoptotic proteins like BCL2. The best example is follicular lymphoma. We know that. Tumor promoting inflammation, this is a new one. Okay, they have added this new thing, tumor promoting inflammation. So many people might think like tumor promoting inflammation may not be correct. So uh, how at the same time it can evade immunity and can promote inflammation. This might seem counterintuitive. But yes, certain tumors thrive in inflammation. That inflammatory microenvironment is important for metastasis and invasion, according to recent research. So certain tumors purposefully promote inflammation, plus they evade immunity also, thereby promoting invasion and metastasis. So that's a new thing that's added in the hallmarks of cancer. Energy from oxidative phosphorylation is wrong because they don't prefer oxidative phosphorylation. They use something called as aerobic glycolysis. We know that that's otherwise called as Warburg effect. That's always called as Warburg effect. Warburg got Nobel Prize for this discovery. So which means tumors, even in the presence of sufficient amount of oxygen, they still prefer glycolysis. They don't prefer oxidative phosphorylation. We know that. That's what we called as aerobic glycolysis or Warburg effect. So you know any drug that can inhibit aerobic glycolysis? It's not for commercial use. It's not available for commercial use. But there is one drug called 2-deoxyglucose. That's called 2-DG that can block the glycolysis. That's a glycolytic inhibitor. Okay, Warburg effect, glycolytic inhibitor. In exam, if they ask you what is going to inhibit glycolysis, that is 2-deoxyglucose, uh, not very successfully used in cancers, but can be used. Okay, it may be the future. Okay, Warburg effect. Apart from that, we have plenty of other hallmarks, like angiogenesis is a hallmark of a cancer. Okay, increased growth signals. Okay, it's a hallmark. Okay, then invasion and metastasis is a hallmark. Invasion and metastasis is a hallmark of cancer. Okay, plenty of other hallmarks are there. And uh, telomerase activation. Telomerase activation. Telomerase activation is also a hallmark. So there are plenty of hallmarks. Immune evasion, escaping growth inhibitory signals, tumor promoting inflammation, angiogenesis, excessive growth factors, invasion metastasis, telomerase activation. Okay, all are basically hallmarks of cancer. Energy from oxidative phosphorylation is not a hallmark, rather they rely on aerobic glycolysis or Warburg effect. I mean, yes, many people are commenting on PET scan. Yes, that's the basis of your post emission tomography as well. Coming to seventh question, a 23-year-old man with Hodgkin lymphoma successfully treated with ABVD regime, which of the following treatment in this patient is cell cycle specific? This is actually one of the superb questions, I would say, because it integrates two things. You need to know what is ABVD regime used in Hodgkin lymphoma. And you need to know what are the drugs that are cell cycle specific and you need to answer accordingly. First of all, what are the drugs that are used in ABVD regime? One is adriamycin, anthracycline that is nothing but your doxorubicin, anti-tumor antibiotic, B stands for bleomycin, B stands for bleomycin, V stands for uh, vinblastin, it's a vinca alkaloid, D stands for dacarbazin, dacarbazin, okay. So adriamycin, doxorubicin is an anti-tumor antibiotic, okay. Is it cell cycle specific or not? It is not cell cycle specific. Anti-tumor antibiotics like adriamycin are not cell cycle specific. Bleomycin cell cycle specific or not? Yes, it is cell cycle specific. It is cell cycle specific and it's going to be specific for G2 phase. We know that. And is dacarbazin specific for uh, cell cycle? No, it is not cell cycle specific. Dacarbazin is not cell cycle specific. Rather, dacarbazin is an alkylating agent. We know that it will come under methylating agents. Okay, methylating agents. It's a not alkylating. I mean, among alkylating agents, 
Dacarbazine will come under something called as methylating agent. Dacarbazine. Methylating agent. Not, I mean, 100% alkylating is basically a methylating agent. But it will come under alkylating agent group only. So what about uh, vinblastin? Yes, vinblastin is cell cycle specific because it's a wing alkaloid. So it's a microtubule inhibitor. So they're going to be specific for M phase. So we have two drugs that are specific for M phase here. Alkylating agents, no, not specific for any cell cycle. Corticosteroids, yes, relatively specific for G1 phase. Antimetabolites, yes, they are specific for S phase. Plant alkaloids, these are nothing but wing alkaloids. They are specific for M phase. But the question is not, okay, question is not what? What is the cell cycle specific drug? The question is, which drug that is used in the treatment of this regime is cell cycle specific? Now you can answer. So in the regime that is used for treating Hodgkin lymphoma, okay, bleomycin and vinblastin are basically cell cycle specific, which means even though B, C, D are all cell cycle specific, the drug that is used in this regime that is cell cycle specific is plant alkaloids. That is vinblastin. Okay, that is the right answer for this question. The answer is option B. Now you can understand. That's why I told you this is a beautiful question. So that tests a lot of things. So you need to know what is ABVD regime, which is very commonly used in patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. Plus at the same time, you need to know like uh, which of the following drugs is cell cycle specific. So let me now tell what are the drugs that are cell cycle specific. Let me divide the cells into G1 phase, S phase, G2 phase, and M phase. So what are the drugs that are specific in G1 phase? One is asparaginase that is used in acute lymphoblastic leukemia and you have corticosteroids. Okay, they are relatively specific for G1 phase. S phase, only one group, anti-metabolites. Okay, all the anti-metabolites, purine analogs, pyrimidine analogs, cytidine analogs, okay, and folate antagonists. Okay, all are specific for S phase. What is specific for M phase? Anti-microtubule drugs. Anti-microtubule drugs. So what are the anti-microtubule drugs? We have vinca alkaloids obtained from vinca rosia and we have, uh, what is that, uh, taxanes, okay, dosataxel and paclitaxel. Okay, so these are the two drugs that are going to be specific for uh, M phase. And another one, so we have DNA topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. DNA topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. So what are the DNA topoisomerase 2 inhibitors? We have etoposide and we have teniposide. These are basically, what are these? These are basically uh, epipodophilotoxins. So these are specific for M phase. And what about G2, G2 blockers? So bleomycin, mitomycin, okay, these are anti-tumor antibiotics that are specific. Bleomycin, mitomycin, then um, we have another drug, what is that? Uh, one more anti-tumor antibiotic is there, but nevertheless. So bleomycin, mitomycin, then um, DNA topoisomerase 1. DNA topoisomerase 1 inhibitors. What are these drugs? These are camptothecin analogs. Irinotecan, topotecan. You can remember that easily, isn't it? Irinotecan, topotecan. Irinotecan, topotecan. How to remember that? I can. I can, I can, I can, can, one, topoisomerase one inhibitors, I can, okay, topoisomerase one inhibitors, irinotecan and topotecan, that's easy way to remember, okay, so nevertheless, so these are G2 specific drugs, DNA topoisomerase one inhibitors, bleomycin, mitomycin are all G2 specific drugs, so what are non-specific, cell cycle non-specific drugs, two groups, one, all the alkylating agents, all the alkylating agents, okay, cell cycle non-specific. So the best example, busulfan. Then you have nitrosurias, carmustin, lomustin. Then you have, what are they, uh, nitrogen mustards, like cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, okay. Then melphalan, chlorambucil, these are nitrogen mustards. They will all come under alkylating agents and some methylating agents, like uh, you have the timozolomide. Dacarbazine, procarbazin, all are basically alkylating agents or basically simply called methylating agents. So nitrosurias like carmustine, lomustine, nitrogen mustards like uh, cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, 
um, melphalan and chlorambucil and other drugs like busulfan and methylating agents like temazolamide, procarbazine, dacarbazine. These are all alkylating agents. They are non-cell cycle specific. And apart from that, we have another agent, so anti-tumor antibiotics. Not all anti-tumor antibiotics are cell cycle specific, cell cycle non-specific. In the anti-tumor antibiotics, the anthracyclines and actinomycin D. Actinomycin D, the anthracyclines. What are anthracyclines? The doxorubicin, idarubicin, okay, epirubicin. So anthracycline group or anthraquinone group. So this will be uh, non-cell cycle specific okay the only exception for that will be your metomycin apart from that anthracyclines generally will be cell cycle non-specific and actinomycin d is also cell cycle non-specific so alkylating agents anti-tumor antibiotics among the anti-tumor antibiotics act, uh, anthracycline group and actinomycin d so these are the non-cell cycle specific group apart from that everything else will have some specificity for cell cycle so right answer for this question is D, plant alkaloids. It's a, it's a beautiful question. So this is a recent FMG question. People are asking, you know, like uh, somebody has asked, like it's not relevant to NEET exam. So this is an exam question. This is a NEET exam question. So this you think is a NEET exam question? No, it's one of the INACT exam questions, 2014 for that matters. Is this a NEET exam question? No, this is not NEET exam question. This is my question. This is, this is also my question, but this is a NEET exam question. Neat exam, my question, my question, neat exam question, neat exam question. This is actually a recent FMG question. A patient was about to receive cisplatin for chemotherapy. What are the drugs that can be offered to prevent or reduce uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting? Straight question from Harrison. Straight, straight away. Straight question from Harrison. No doubt about that. Straight question. The right answer is option A. Okay. First of all, whenever you are talking about chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, so first you need to restatify the drugs. So high risk, intermediate risk, low risk. High risk, intermediate risk, and low risk drugs. Low risk drugs. There are only three high risk drugs. Technically, only three high risk drugs are there. Only three high risk drugs. One is cisplatin cisplatin second drug is going to be your um, dacarbazine okay dacarbazine third drug is going to be high dose cyclophosphamide exactly given in harrison okay so this question is totally based on harrison line by line from harrison they have asked this question high dose cyclophosphamide okay these are the three drugs that will come under high risk group what are the drugs that are going to come under intermediate risk group cyclophosphamide Cyclophosphamide at conventional doses, usual doses, usual dose cyclophosphamide, conventional doses, not high dose. High dose means we are talking about a dose of more than 1500 milligram per meter square dose. That is high dose. So conventional dose cyclophosphamide, carboplatin, okay, carboplatin. And use of anthracyclines like doxorubicin, use of anthracyclines like doxorubicin. So these all will come under intermediate risk drugs but carboplatin is going to come under intermediate risk drugs okay so predominantly what are the drugs that are going to cause MSS? it's the alkylating agents like cisplatin cisplatin is not a cell cycle specific drug it's a platinum compound it's an alkylating agent cisplatin is an alkylating agent not cell cycle specific I mean, it doesn't do alkylation rather it do something called platination but the group will be alkylating agents group it's not cell cycle specific Dacarbazin is alkylating group, not cell cycle specific. Cyclophosphamide, alkylating group, not cell cycle specific. Anthracycline, doxorubicin, not cell cycle specific, which means most of the drugs that produce vomiting, non cell cycle specific groups, okay, which means they affect every single cell in the body. That's why they're going to cause a lot of problems like vomiting, okay. These are two things that you need to know. Most of them are non, -cycle, non cell cycle specific drugs, and that's one. that's the ones that are going to induce nausea. So, See others, you can put others, don't need to remember. I can, if I tell everything, you will get confused. So you can put low risk others. So high risk patients, typically we treat with triple therapy. Triple therapy. Moderate risk groups, we are going to treat dual therapy. Dual therapy. For high and low risk groups, monotherapy is enough. Monotherapy is enough. So these three drugs, how are going to treat triple therapy? So what are you going to use? You're going to use dexamethasone, that's a steroid. Plus you have to use one 5-HT3 blocker. Cetron antagonists like ondansetron or granisetron. 
third i'm going to use a neurokinin 1 antagonist like apropitant you know apropitant neurokinin so this is the triple therapy that they are suggesting at least in the first day you have to give day one this is should this should be the therapy at least for prophylaxis what about dual treatment dual treatment means here we don't use neurokinin 1 so typically we use dexamethasone plus a 5-ht3 combination 5-ht3 antagonist okay then what about monotherapy monotherapy we use either dexamethasone or you can use a 5-ht3 antagonist 5-ht3 antagonist okay that's for monotherapy dexamethasone or 5-ht3 antagonist either granisetron or ondansetron or dexamethasone anyone you can use which means you need not use aparapitan for moderate and low risk patients intermittent low risk patients you need not use aparapitan which is costly and it need not be used unnecessarily but remember if you are going to combine two intermediate risk groups for example cyclophosphamide and anthracycline doxorubicin very commonly we use this combination cyclophosphamide doxorubicin commonly 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 we are going to use that combination cyclophosphamide with doxorubicin in that case it becomes high risk so it's better to follow this protocol okay if you are using two intermediate risk groups like cyclophosphamide and doxorubicin together very commonly that combination will be used in practice if that is the case follow triple therapy if that is the case follow triple therapy don't go for dual therapy this question is pretty much simple cisplatin high risk carboplatin means intermediate risk it's a high risk you have to use triple therapy dexa 5-HT3 blocker and a neurocanin 1 antagonist. That's the right answer. Other drugs, fine. You can use D2 blockers or not, but they're not that effective. But trust me, next time they might ask this question. Same Harrison, exact line. What they mentioned, refractory, which means you have used all the therapies. Refractory, what is the drug that you can use? Olenzepin. Anyone will even think about this drug? Olenzepin, which is an atypical anti-psychotic anti drug. Olenzepin, can anyone think about this? Yes. Once they ask in Harrison, probably you will remember. I mean, once they ask in exams, you will remember probably. Otherwise, you won't remember. This is mentioned in Harrison. Olenzepin for refractory chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Fine. Could be an exam question. What about diarrhea? What is the most common drug that causes diarrhea? Fluoropyrimidines. Because these drugs are actually toxic to toxic to GIT. They are going to particularly injure the large intestine that's why diarrhea is very common what are the fluoropyrimidines or pyrimidine analogs 5 fluororacil okay it's an anti-metabolite drug it's cell cycle specific s specific and we have capacitabin cannabinoids yes has been tried but it's an alternative it's not a very important drug okay 5 fluororacil 5 fluororacil capacitabin two drugs i mean capacitabin is just an oral prodrug of 5 fluororacil everyone knows that so what is the treatment most commonly mostly it's going to be 5 fluoracil but whether these drugs produce vomiting or not no they don't produce vomiting vomiting risk is very very low with these drugs very very low they don't produce vomiting at all because they don't even cross the blood brain barrier vomiting is not there but they cause significant diarrhea that's why treatment if they ask you lopiramide lopiramide okay that's the first line drug this is also an exam question. If you trust me, just look at the questions. This is also has been asked. Mucositis. What are the drugs that commonly produce mucositis? Many drugs can produce mucositis. Okay. But your mTOR inhibitors can produce mucositis. If they ask you treatment of mucositis, severe mucositis, palifermin. Palifermin. IV palifermin. This is a keratinocyte growth factor. That's a keratinocyte growth factor. Severe mucositis. What do you do? Palifermin. Okay. Some important chemotherapy side effects. Okay. So now coming to an oncologic emergency. All of the following would be important for prevention of clinical tumor lysis. CTLS stands for clinical tumor lysis syndrome. Except, again, this is a straight line from Harrison because this is an update in the 20th and 21st edition. Because till 19th edition, they have been mentioning something else. Not till 19, till 20th edition, they have been mentioning something else. But in 21st edition, they have changed this. There's a clear-cut update in Harrison, 21st edition update. That's why I said this question, because this is kind. This is the kind of a future that you're going to get. So which of the following is not used in tumor lysis syndrome? That's what they're asking, following treatment. Administration of allopurinol, 300 milligram per meter square daily. Same dose that's given in Harrison, that's correct. You can give allopurinol. Administration of IV fluids at a minimum of 3 liter per meter square per day. Yes, that's correct. 
So you can remember allopurinol 300 fluids 3 liters. Allopurinol 300 fluids 3000. Okay, 3 liters. Okay, frequent monitoring of serum chemistry is every 4 hours. Yes. So every 4 to 8 hours, depending on the risk. If the patient is at high risk, then I'm going to monitor uric acid every 3, three hours. If it's low risk, I'm going to monitor every 8 hours. So how to risk stratify, that's not important. But what is changed in the 21st edition of Harrison? It is this alkalinization of urine that is not required. That's that's something that's a kind of a major change in the recent edition. And that's a major change in the many guidelines as well. Previously, we believed that urinary alkalinization is going to increase the excretion of uric acid so that you can reduce the precipitation of monosodium urate crystals. 100% correct. But, but it also says, many research says that, yes, it lowers the excretion of many other important products like xanthin, hypoxanthin, xanthin, hypoxanthin and calcium phosphate. These are also very, very important in the setting of tumor lysis syndrome. So what happens in tumor lysis syndrome? You're going to have hyperuricemia. Everyone knows that. Hyperkalemia. Everyone knows that. Hyperphosphatemia. Everyone knows that. And this phosphorus is going to chelate calcium, resulting in low levels of ionic calcium hypocalcemia. So among these four, if you have at least two, you're going to call it as laboratory tumor lysis syndrome or LTLS. At least two, laboratory tumor lysis syndrome. If this results in some clinical problems, what clinical problems? The phosphorus and the uric acid. Remember, the uric acid can result in monosodium urate crystal formation. The calcium and phosphorus can produce calcium phosphate okay and this can result in acute kidney injury aki point number one and hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia okay hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia can result in arrhythmias arrhythmias that can kill the patient and hypocalcemia can cause seizures and that itself can cause arrhythmias and seizures also tetany also so many problems are there if there is at least one clinical problem because of these electrolyte imbalances, you're going to call it as clinical tumor lysis syndrome. What is that? Clinical tumor lysis syndrome. So two laboratory abnormalities, LTLS. At least one clinical problem because of all the electrolyte abnormalities, that's called clinical tumor lysis. So, so what all you can do? So you can give IV fluids. The answer itself says the treatment. IV fluids, yes, you have to give excess IV fluids. Allopurinol, yes, we give. Alternative to allopurinol will be rasburicase. Alternative to allopurinol will be rasburicase. But remember, pegloticase is not indicated for this purpose. Pegloticase is only for gout. Rasburicase is only for tumor lysis. Don't confuse both. Rasburicase. And one important point about rasburicase, it's contraindicated in G6 pre deficiency. That could be an exam question. You cannot use rasburicase or pegloticase in G6 pre deficiency. Don't use it. Rasburicase. Alternative to allopurinol is rasburicase. Or you can use febuxostat also. No problem. The only difference allopurinol is a purine analog. It's a competitive blocker. Febuxostat is not a purine analog. It's, it's a non competitive blocker. That's all. Any one you can use. Rasburicase you can use. It's a recombinant uricase enzyme. Okay, but urinary alkalinization was done before, but currently it's removed from the guidelines. It should not be done. So now, one radiation oncology question CSA stands for craniospinal irradiation. What is that? Craniospinal irradiation where it where you don't use craniospinal irradiation there are six indications for craniospinal irradiation where you don't use craniospinal irradiation i mean primarily used where answer is medulloblastoma okay there are some few indications what are the other indications for craniospinal irradiation apart from medulloblastoma there are certain things that can be asked in exams So what are the indications? So indication number one is medulloblastoma. Indication number two is think about many childhood tumors, supratentorial peanuts, supratentorial primitive neuroectodermal tumors. Number three, you have germinomas, many childhood tumors, germinomas. Number four, um, epidymoblastoma. 
Epen dimoblastoma or simply Epen dimoma. Number five, penialoblastoma. Penialoblastoma. Number six will be um, leukemias. Leukemias or lymphomas with leptomeningeal metastasis. Leukemias or lymphomas with LM. LM stands for leptomeningeal metastasis. But they, they will ask you where you won't use. Solid organ tumors with leptomeningeal metastasis. There is no role for craniospinal irradiation. Where you don't use solid organ tumors with leptomeningeal metastasis. In this area, there is no role. Don't use for solid organ tumors. But hematological cancers with leptomeningeal metastasis, yes. Or primary CNS tumors, sometimes yes. But not for solid organ tumors with leptomeningeal metastasis. Then other question what they may ask. Where will you use prophylactic whole brain irradiation? Prophylactic whole brain irradiation, whole brain irradiation prophylactically only in two conditions. Small cell lung cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Second question. Third question. They will ask you where will you use total body irradiation prior to allogenic stem cell transplant. Allogenic stem cell transplant prior to that I am going to do total body irradiation. Whole body irradiation. And where will you use total skin electron beam therapy? Because we know electrons are not going to penetrate beyond the skin. They are beta particles. They don't penetrate beyond the skin. So it's going to be for skin cancers. Like cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, especially mycosis fungoides. These four questions can be asked in exams. Indication for craniospinal irradiation. Indication for prophylactic whole brain irradiation. Indication for total brain or uh, total body irradiation. And indication for total skin electron beam therapy. So just one question from radiation oncology. Okay, coming to 11th question, which of the following, again, these are easy questions, I think everyone will be able to answer pretty easily. Which of the following is most likely to be due to underlying cause of anemia in patients with chronic heart failure? We know that chronic heart failure means this must be anemia of chronic disease. So, increased RBC restriction secondary to deposition of complement on the RBC membrane is wrong because this is a mechanism of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, okay, not anemia of chronic disease. Increased blood loss, no, that's usually going to cause iron deficiency anemia. And increase, decrease life of RBC because of malarity changes in RBC membrane? No, this is going to be the reason for probably hereditary spherocytosis or something like that. Or maybe paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. The right answer is going to be option D. Reduce intestinal absorption of iron. Secondary to increase hepcidin levels because hepcidin blocks something called ferroportin that prevents the absorption of iron and release of iron into the blood by reticular endothelial system. So this anemia of chronic disease, the right answer is option D. Pretty easy one. Coming to question 12. Uh, 13 year old male presents with vague abdominal pain and erectile dysfunction. ED stands for erectile dysfunction. ED stands for erectile dysfunction. I think my phone got switched off. Okay, all right. I'm not able to see. What I'll do is I'll uh, use my laptop itself. Just hold on. Because otherwise I'll lose touch with you. Okay, I can use this itself. All right. So erectile dysfunction. So what's occurring here? He's also complaining of fatigue and light pink urine. Laps is hemoglobin 8.1, increased retics, haptoglobin low, LDH high. Clearly suggests this is a hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic anemia and bilirubin is also elevated. Characteristic of hemolytic anemia. They are asking about which of will cell surface protein loss in flow cytometry will be most likely responsible for the hemoglobinuria in this patient. So, it's PNH, isn't it? So, what's the triad of PNH? Classic triad of PNH will be um, hemolysis. Okay, causing nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Hemoglobinuria. Or patient can have hemosiderinuria also. And second, patients will have thrombotic manifestations. In fact, this is the most common reason for death in these patients. Typically, there will be thrombosis of Cerebral veins, CVT and splanchnic veins like Bucciari syndrome and all. Thrombotic manifestation occur in the splanchnic circulation. Bucciari syndrome, mesenteric vein thrombosis, central vein thrombosis like that. So that's unusual areas are common. Third is pancytopenia. And they'll ask you pancytopenia with cellular or acellular marrow. In a classic PNH, it's going to be with cellular marrow. Okay, that's what you need to answer for exam. So sometimes there could be overlap with uh, a plastic anemia where you can have a cellular marrow, but uh, usually it will be a cellular marrow. In a classic PNH, it's cellular marrow only. So what is the investigation of choice? Flow cytometry. What is the treatment of choice? Eculizumab. I mean, not 
treatment of choice, though it's a first line treatment that we currently use is anti C5 monoclonal antibody that's called eculizumab. But technically, if I teach undergrads, I have to be a little careful because uh, they are a little like uh, sometimes not having clinical expertise. No? So they might think like when I use the term treatment of choice or first line, that might be a big deal for them. So treatment of choice, they will say it's allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. <laughs> yes, but uh, first line treatment is, that's what we use actually, to be honest, treatment of choice is this because many patients we don't take for allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, but eclizumab is the first line treatment as of now. So investigation of choice is flow cytometry. You have to look for the CD55 and CD59 on the surface of this WBCs and RBCs. So CD55 is also called as DK accelerating factor. CD59 is also called as Mirils membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis. That's the one that's going to protect um, the blood cells from like going for lysis. If that is not there, the complement mediated destruction will occur. Coming to this question, 13th question. So I'll finish off faster because uh, I think it's very late. It's almost 1.30. So 60 year old patient was admitted for infected wound which he received vancomycin. He developed number of bruises on his arms with no obvious signs of trauma. PTA, PTT is within normal limits. HPV, HP are negative. WBC 6.5, hemoglobin 14.2. Platelets 18,000 which means patients are having low platelets. And um, in previous laboratory examinations, all laboratory levels are found to be within normal limits. Based on patient's clinical presentation, which of the following is the more likely explanation of patient's findings? So, I mean, the picture, what I've given is suggestive of like ITP. But remember, it's always a diagnosis of exclusion. ITP is always a diagnosis of exclusion. That's what you need to know. Primary ITP is always a diagnosis of Exclusion, idiopathic thrombocytopenia. You have to rule out each and every cause. And that the most important thing that we miss is drug-induced thrombocytopenia. Vancomycin is one of the important drugs that cause drug-induced thrombocytopenia. Heparin, vancomycin, many antibiotics. Many drugs can induce antibodies against platelets and that could be the usual reason. Unless and until you stop vancomycin and look for the improvement of the platelets and then confirm it's not drug-induced thrombocytopenia, till that I cannot rule out drug-induced thrombocytopenia. The right answer for this question is going to be option A only. Before ruling out that, I cannot make a diagnosis of ITP, idiopathic immune thrombocytic purpura. So because it's a diagnosis of exclusion, I have to rule out everything. So how primary ITP will present? It's an isolated thrombocytopenia. Isolated thrombocytopenia. That's how it's going to present. Isolated thrombocytopenia. That's how it's going to present. Number one. Number two, which means in CBC, no abnormality. See, linazolid doesn't cause ITP. Linazolid causes bone marrow suppression. You know the side effects of linazolid. I'm literally sleeping, but I can say easily the side effects of linazolid is going to be uh, peripheral neuropathy, bone marrow suppression causing thrombocytopenia predominantly, and lactic acidosis. Three are important side effects of linazolid. Lactic acidosis, bone marrow suppression, and peripheral neuropathy. Okay, three important side effects of linazolid. So that's bone marrow suppression, not mechanism. There is not antibody formation but vancomycin yes one of the antibodies thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura why see what are the other features that the patient is having except thrombocytopenia why not d i say where is the ttb feature man patient will have fever here patient will have neurological manifestations patient will have thrombocytopenia patient will have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia which means cystocytes will be there in the peripheral smear and patient will have evidence of hemolysis and patient have AKI. This is the TTP pentad, right? Where is where is the TTP pentad? How can you say it's a TTP? There is nothing to say it's a TTP. Patient is having isolated thrombocytopenia, right? So primary ATP, isolated thrombocytopenia. Peripheral smear will be normal. So which means smear will be normal except for thrombocytopenia. Smear will be completely normal. And bone marrow will be bone marrow aspiration will be normal. Which means the production of megakaryocytes is normal. There is no problem. Everything will be normal. The only thing is platelets are low. So you confirm it's a peripheral plus you rule out other causes. You rule out all the other causes of thrombocytopenia. Then only you can make a diagnosis. In that, what are the things you have to rule out? HIV has to be ruled out. Hepatitis C virus has to be ruled out. Drugs has to be ruled out. Connective tissue disorders has to be ruled out. Like SLE for example. SLE for example. These are things has to be ruled out. Then only you can make a diagnosis of Immune, idiopathic immune thrombocytopenic purpura. What is the treatment? So acute treatment, you can use IVIG if it's severe or plus or minus, you can use corticosteroids for short time. Okay, corticosteroids like prednisolone. 
But for chronic treatment, I cannot use both. I need to use alternative. So currently, there are two conflicting things that we use. Either we can use TPO mimetics. Okay, TPO mimetics. Like l thrombopag or Romiplostim, you know that. These are TPO mimetics, l thrombopag or Romiplostim. Or alternatively, I can use other drugs like Rituximab. This is another option. Or alternatively, I can use... Uh, I mean, this is not available in India. That's called a sick inhibitor. That's called splenic tyrosine kinase inhibitor. That's called fostamatinib. And we have plenty of other options. Azathioprine, microfinlet moftel. So many have, have been come, but we don't use those things. Okay, We use either a TPO mimetic like Romiplostim or L-thrombopag, or we're going to use anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody like Reduxmab, which is going to basically reduce the amount of antibodies that are formed in uh, ITP. So if you reduce the amount of antibodies, you can reduce the platelet destruction because this is an antibody mediated problem. It's a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. So acute IVAG corticosteroids, IVAG only for severe cases of thrombocytopenia, refractory cases of thrombocytopenia, urgent treatment IVAG, but for all cases, we start corticosteroids only. For chronic treatment, corticosteroids are not good. Rather, we prefer either a TPO mimetic or rituximab. Splenectomy is the last resort. Last resort. If there is no other option, you can perform splenectomy. Last resort. Because even though, yes, correct, spleen is the site of destruction in ITP for platelets, but we use that as a last resort. We don't use that as a primary first line option. But you have to vaccinate them because the risk of OPSI is very high. Okay. Uh, 32 year old woman presents two years after. Treatment and remission of classic Hodgkin lymphoma with painful cervical lymphadenopathy. FDG PET shows hypermetabolic lesions in right infraclinical, bilateral, hilar, para, aortic, and inguinal lymph nodes. Which of the following would be frontline therapy for recurrent disease? This is a tough question, I agree, because it's based on Harrison. That's why it's tough. So, first of all, they have used uh, primary treatment. Okay. So, initial treatment will be ABVD. For most of the case of Hodgkin lymphoma, this is very commonly asked in the exam. Initial treatment will be ABVD regime. So for relapse, I cannot use ABVD. The best option for relapse is eye salvage therapy. I'll, I don't talk about that, but let me uh, tell you what you mean by classic Hodgkin lymphoma, what you mean by nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So classic Hodgkin lymphoma, more than 95% cases. Nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, less than 5% cases. What will be the markers? CD15, 30 positive, CD20 negative. So nodular lymphocyte predominant, CD15, 30, negative, CD20, positive. You're going to see classic Hodg reed strandberg cells, RS cells. Rather, you don't see reed strandberg cells. Rather, you see certain type of cells called as popcorn reed strandberg cells. It should not be called as reed strandberg cells though, but it's called as popcorn cells. And what will be the treatment? First line treatment for both, first line treatment for both will be ABVD regime. ABVD regime plus or minus ISRT will be the first line treatment for both. ABVD plus or minus ISRT. So ABVD, we know, we discussed already. Adriamycin, bleomycin, vinblastin and dacarbazin. ISRT stands for involved site radiotherapy. For selected cases, we use radiation therapy also to ablate those lymph nodes that are tumorous. And in case, I mean, because these tumors express CD30, you can use something called Brentuximab Vedotin. Brentuximab Vedotin is an option you can use because it's an anti-CD30 monoclonal antibody. But you cannot use Brentuximab here because NLPHL does not express CD30 and CD20 is positive. So you can use Rituximab here as an option. But I cannot use Rituximab here because it's CD20 negative. That's why. So if it's a relapse, in case if you are encountering a relapse or recurrence, so first treatment, the immediate treatment of relapse will be something called ice salvage therapy, salvage chemotherapy. Here you use something called rice. Okay, so what is ice? No need to know, but this just to make a tough question, it's not important for exams. I phosphate carboplatin etoposide, but here I can use rituximab. Why rituximab I can use? Because they express CD20. So that is the important point there. So rituximab, iphosphamide, then carboplatin etoposide. This is the usual salvage regime that we use. If it's NLPHL, I'm going to use rice. If it's uh, classic Hodgkin lymphoma, I'm going to use just ice. NLPHL has a very good prognosis. Classic Hodgkin lymphoma has a variable prognosis. 
So we have multiple different types, but which NL classic optical lymphoma histological types will be usually ABV positive. ABV positive will be two types. One is mixed cellularity type and second one will be lymphocyte rich type. HIV is associated with lymphocyte poor type, the worst prognosis. But lymphocyte rich type, 40% of the times you will have EBV positivity and mixed cellular type, 70% of the times EBV will be positive. These are the two important subtypes of classic Hodgkin lymphoma that are going to be typically EBV positive. Okay, variable prognosis depending on subtype. Most common subtype is nodular sclerosing subtype. You all know you are going to see something called collagen bands. Printixone vidotin is not for classic Hodgkin, sorry, it can be used for classic Hodgkin lymphoma but not the first line therapy. Not first line therapy. Betamastone we don't use for Hodgkin lymphoma. All three are wrong. Basically this is right but not important for exams. Just to make the question paper difficult, I just want to give this kind of questions. And last but not the least, a 67 year old woman presenting with painless cervical lymphadenopathy. A WBC count is uh, 5000. Absolute neutrophil count is 2500. Absolute lymphocyte count is 1900. This is a very very important point. Platelets 2,20,000, Hb 13.9, bilateral cervical axillary and inguinal lymphadenopathy, bone marrow aspiration demonstrate, normal trial lineage hematopoiesis. Flow cytometry of axillary lymph node biopsy shows a population of neoplastic lymphoid cell which is identified as CD5 positive, CD23 uh, positive but negative for CD10 and CD38. C uh, cyclin D1 stain is also negative which means it's not mantle cell lymphoma. They are, there are no cytogenic abnormalities identified which is the most likely diagnosis. It's your answer. Who's going to answer this question? Mantle cell, it's not mantle cell lymphoma. See, mantle cell lymphoma will be CD5 positive, CD23 negative, okay, CD23 negative, and cyclin D1 positive. If cyclin D1 is negative, then you can confirm with something called SOX11. You would have studied that. SOX11 we don't use commonly, only for CCND negative, cyclin D1 negative mantle cell lymphomas, LAN for lymphadenopathy, LAN for cervical lymphadenopathy. Somebody is asking what is LAN? lymphadenopathy okay this probes your understanding in depth so remember all three are united disorders okay small cell uh, small lymphocytic leukemia chronic lymphocytic leukemia and uh, monoclonal b cell lymphocytosis so what is the difference between them so first let me talk about monoclonal b lymphocytosis where the absolute lymphocyte count will be more than 5000 plus there will be no lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly in Small in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, absolute lymphocyte count. Sorry, come back to that. What is your answer? Sorry, monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, your absolute lymphocyte count is going to be less than 5000. This will be clonal B cells. These are clonal malignant B cells. But there won't be any um, lymphadenopathy generally. No lymphadenopathy. On the other hand, what is chronic lymphocytic leukemia? CLL, absolute lymphocyte count will be more than 5000 and there will be clonal cells. These are cancer cells plus no significant lymphadenopathy. So small lymphocytic lymphoma, absolute lymphocyte count less than 5000 plus evidence of lymphadenopathy and these are clonal malignant cells which are going to be monoclonal. These are three terms. One is monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, second is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, third is small lymphocytic lymphoma. So look at what's happening here. Here the patient is having an absolute lymphocyte count of less than 5000. It's not more than 5000. It is 1900 and the patient is presenting with significant lymphadenopathy and everywhere cervical axillary inguinal everywhere there's lymphadenopathy so what is the clonality all of this three patients will have cd5 positivity cd23 positivity and cd1920 maybe dim positive or positive whatever but cd5 will be positive cd20 will be positive 23 will be positive that says this is a case of 
small lymphocytic lymphoma okay so why small lymphocytic lymphoma because here the b cells are predominantly present in the lymph nodes the b cells are not present in the peripheral blood if the b cells are predominantly present in the peripheral blood then uh, you can call it as chronic lymphocytic leukemia because here the b cells are not present in the peripheral blood it is not leukemia rather it's a lymphoma because patient is having a evidence of lymph node enlargement it is definitely not mantle cell lymphoma that can be easily ruled out based on the immunophenotyping but the idea is to differentiate between these three entities so it's not chronic lymphocytic leukemia it's not monoclonal b cell lymphocytes it's small lymphocytic lymphoma because alc less than 5000 and you have lymphadenopathy and you have the clonal b cells 5 positive 23 positive b cells these are malignant cells lymphoma okay more than 5000 and lymph number is still it will come under CLL only more than 5000 and lymphadenopathy still will come under CLL only you do not talk about lymphoma in that setting so whenever you say you see more than 5000 cells maybe I can write plus or minus yes your question is correct plus or minus lymphadenopathy if you see more than 5000 cells means it's CLL only it's chronic lymphocytic leukemia so you can make it as plus or minus here clear I think understood so what is the treatment of choice first line treatment anyone wants to answer so first line treatment anyone wants to answer ibrutinib it's a brutin styrosin kinase inhibitor ibrutinib if they ask you drug of choice is the first line treatment as far as the current evidence current research ibrutinib is considered to be first line ibrutinib is a brutin styrosin kinase inhibitor btk inhibitor brutus tyrosine kinase inhibitor okay cool so lymphomas are again very important i know in pathology they were taught in and out about all the markers of uh, like different lymphomas so where is semic positive where is you're going to see the t814 or eight related translocations 1418 where 1114 where i think everywhere you'd have studied so i'm not going to talk about that right now so that's 100 percent like uh, going to be a waste of time if i'm discussing in medicine so hopefully like the questions gave some kind of like thinking in terms of uh, your thinking ability and i think i'm like i'm, trying, I'm, I'm not saying now okay it's better that i go and sleep thank you very much see you soon bye bye and all the very best and uh, hopefully you all come out in flying colors okay no, no, ibrutinib only for CLL. I mean, not all cases we are going to treat. Not all CLL cases will be treated. Only selected CLL cases. There is some indications for treatment separately. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon. And uh, this completes the end of your uh, Medicine Saturdays and Marathon session. Trust me, we have done more than 30 hours of medicine okay only the medicine saturdays alone cross 30 32 hours of medicine so if you're going to study the session which i did on pyq and first starting from the first one pyq on table session then go and study the fmg revision that's for neat exam also fmg part one part two revision then look at all of what i have discussed in the uh, uh, MCQ discussion, TND discussion, everything is like 3-4 hours plus each and every session. So if you're going to discuss all of those things, I mean if you're going to ready, pro, uh, study all of those things properly, definitely I don't think like you need anything more in medicine at least uh, for this NEET exam. So hopefully like if you're going to succeed, that's going to be like a big, big, big achievement of whatever I've been doing for so long. And thank you so much. Yes, but study the FMG session also. Don't leave because when I tell FMG, like people think like it's for FMG. No, no, the questions are not going to be like any different. So I told you so many times the exam is different. That's all. So that's a qualifying exam. Neat is a competitive exam. That's all. But apart from that, like both exams are going to have similar kind of questions prepared by a similar board. So don't ignore. Okay. So read those sessions, the PYQ and table, FMG part one, part two, all the six or seven like TND discussions I have made, please do that. Don't forget. And definitely like I feel like you will be able to have an edge in the exam. And uh, I believe like many of you will be messaging me later on like how many of you have cracked the exams. Thank you very much. See you. Bye-bye.
All the best.